is Judson Pierce, and I'm proud to chair this thoughtful committee one last time. Uh, before uh, we start our formal part of the evening, we have some special dignitaries in the house, and I'd like to recognize them. Uh, first, our state representative, Sean Garbley, is here. If you might be able to join us at the... We have uh, some presentations and some celebrations to do before the evening really gets started. So. Okay. Yeah. Garbley, welcome. And uh, Selectman Curo come and up as well. Yeah, what, both of you at, at the same time. That'd be great. <coughs> Selectman Joe Curo, good evening. Thank you. Um, well, first, uh, I just want to congratulate you, uh, Chairman Pierce, for doing a, a fantastic job this year as chairing this esteemed committee. I think you've done an extremely uh, terrific job, and I'm sure <coughs> proud of the work that you've led uh, with your fellow committee members. So congratulations on your last meeting. I know your family's here, and I know they're they're looking forward to having you back more. Uh, <laughs> but you really have done a great job, and I it's been a great to have you at, as a partner as well as the other members of the committee. Um, I am here because I and I know Selectman Caro is as well. I get to uh, give a little parting gift uh, to my friend Leva Hyam. And I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to do this because she's been such a fabulous voice for the kids of the Arlington Public School System and who's really been a great partner on the Arlington School Committee. And I remember when you were first running LEBA, I know we had talked many times about what I felt uh, the next voice on the school committee needed to bring and you really exceeded all expectations and you've been a tremendous voice for, for education uh, throughout the town of Arlington. I know you've been a pleasure to work with uh, hearing from your colleagues and it's sad to see you go. Uh, it really is. But I think six years on the, on the committee is a long time. Yeah. And I know your family is, <laughs> I think three years on the committee is a long time. So we counted it's not a knock years. at you, Jeff, I'm, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you've, been, you've been terrific. So on behalf of Senator Donnelly, uh, myself and Representative David Rogers, we wanted to present you this citation so be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Lee Hyam in recognition of your years of dedicated service to the Arlington Public Schools and the town of Arlington. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors given this 27th day of March, signed by Speaker of the House Robert A. DeLeo and the Arlington delegation. Congratulations, Lee So, want me to give it to you? <laughs> very nice. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to uh, come back. I, I was just noting that the place looks so much um, better, and I don't know if it's because of my absence. Or <laughs> it looks so much better. Um, and, you know, like uh, Sean, I did want to start and just, you know, thank you, Judd, for your, your leadership. I've been in that spot, and I know uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough deal, but I'm here to, uh, to, tonight to uh, honor who was my wing woman from that, that time, who was my, my able vice chair. Um, I think you all know, you know, Lieber and I, I think the first time we met was um, six years ago at the Martin Luther King um, obs uh, observation, uh, the, the, the uh, used to be the dinner. Um, we, we met there when I was first starting my run for school committee, and uh, she was introduced to me as another candidate. And for the next few months, we would fight over street corners, who, st <laughs> who stood where or, or whatnot, and we would have conversations uh, across, the, um, across the street when, you know, nobody else wanted to talk to us <laughs> and I said we came uh, very close through that and um, and through the the many years uh, you know Liba what you obviously you know what you what you bring to this place is not just you know a commitment to kids but also your background as a professional educator and as an experienced negotiator and how many sessions did you and I sit sit in where um, maybe 30 sessions together at least um, in one particularly difficult contract negotiation, or prolonged, I should say, um, where your expertise was really uh, invaluable. We went to collaborative bargaining sessions together and, and all of that. So I'm, I'm very sorry to see you leaving the committee, but uh, one thing that I, I love and I, I, I miss about th this whole group is that uh, our paths always seem to cross around town, and so I know that we'll see one another, you know, dance recitals and piano recitals and band concerts and, and <laughs> everything, everything else. Um, so uh, 
I don't have any big formal presentation, unfortunately, like Sean did, but um, I do know that a wise man once said that um, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you've really lived up to that mantra. So will you please put, put out your hands, please? Uh, uh -oh. Catch. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that will remind you <laughs> of that mantra that with great power comes great responsibility. And you've exercised your responsibility to Arlington's youth really great. And the great thing about that is it always lands on its feet just like you. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I'm glad I was able to share this. <laughs> Mr. Garland, John, thank you for being a friend to the schools and, and a friend to Arlington. And thank you both for being here tonight. Really a pleasure. I mean, Joe, I definitely have me back again. Sometime. Yeah, <laughs> definitely want to have you back. You came up with Liba. I mean, in 08, I mean, I was, I was sad not to join you both at that time, but it was nice to, to join you a little later on. I know other members of the committee um, have a few words they might want to say and uh, other uh, offerings, if, as they were. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe do that for another five minutes or so, invite, invite the superintendent, assistant superintendent, Rob and Karen, if you'd like, and maybe break for five or 10, 10 minutes or so for recess to have some uh, refreshments before we get started again around seven. Um, so I also want to recognize at our table tonight, Siobhan Foley from the AEA is here with us, and Alex Crowley, a junior, uh, junior class treasurer and president. All right. <laughs> what are, are you president? All right. Welcome. Your honor. And um, also on soccer and basketball. Thank you for being here, Alex. Um, why don't we go around uh, maybe starting with Alex or Siobhan or, or do you have any words or Kiersey? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I didn't know okay. Well, we were warned. I don't know the <laughs> answer because it's hard for me to come up with things off the cuff. But what I'm going to mix, I, I had a few things. One, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. What I'm going to miss is how you were able to be a graceful point person during certain not so distant controversies, which I'm not even going to mention. <laughs> I don't want to bring them back. Um, how you've been able to share the knowledge that you bring from your experience, both as a teacher and administrator, a viewpoint that's been very valuable during negotiations. And seeing in admiration how you've managed your multiple roles on, us, on the school committee, on, in your job as a parent of two lovely young women. And finally, I'm going to miss having a walking partner for the Patriots Day Parade. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll loan you the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Close, but not. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Um, there, there are so many reasons why you were elected to the school committee and why you were a great school committee member. I mean, you understand schools. You understand teaching and learning. You understand contract negotiations. Your experience as a teacher and a principal and, and a union representative were all key. Uh, and, you know, I knew you for several years before you got on the committee because we crossed paths professionally when you were a district math coordinator in Malden. And these are all reasons why you got elected to the school committee and why the voters of Arlington saw, saw your talents. But, uh, you know, when they renovated this room, uh, they, they moved all the cabinets around and something just appeared here. <laughs> And I think this has something to do with your election <laughs> to the school committee. It's a binder it's full of binder. League of Women voter binder. questions. Yeah. Oh, binder. That, that, that's a relic. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so this is where they've been. This wow. is what, I, do, I do have to point out, my binder only had seven tabs. <laughs> oh, the organizations, I mean, impeccable. Oh, it's very hard awesome. to top them. Yeah, it's hard to top them. Well, I, I, I um, remember, it's important to understand the context. When Leva was elected, it was 2008. It was a very divided school committee in a divided town. And what Liba brought to our discussions starting in April of 2008 when she was elected and joined the committee 
was a focus on teaching and learning and on kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, that had a profound impact on the way we deliberated, on the way we made decisions, on the way the school committee moved forward on a number of issues. And you were able to bring your expertise as an educator, your perspective as a mother, um, your expertise as a school administrator, your uh, expertise and experience as a union member in uh, Malden, and uh, that brought a whole fresh perspective because all of a sudden we were talking about teaching and learning, mm -hmm. which is what we should be talking about at a school committee table. And that changed the dynamic and had a profound impact, and I think that's why you were elected by the voters because I think that's what they wanted, and then that's why you were re-elected by the voters. Um, and I wish they were re-electing you now, but you chose otherwise. So, <laughs> so I, I want to thank, I also want to publicly thank your family for supporting you during the past six years because that's an enormous commitment and there were many nights when your husband stayed home, shuffled girls to different events and while you were here serving the town of Arlington. So um, there, were, there were a couple of significant uh, uh, areas where you had <coughs> impact on uh, the committee. Joe mentioned uh, an impact on the schools. Joe mentioned negotiations, the redistricting effort. You led that whole committee and that uh, changed the way we uh, organize our school districts. It's going to change it over time, and that was uh, you found a, a, a peaceful solution to a difficult problem. There was a, a, an awkward, uncomfortable superintendent search uh, that you maneuvered uh, beautifully, and uh, we got the right result. Uh, and so uh, I just thank you for, for, for always reminding us in every discussion, every heated discussion, that it was about students, it was about teaching and learning, and that's but uh, help the committee to get right on the right on the right path. And so we will miss you, mm -hmm. and I thank you for your service. All right. So this is probably you're probably in the same position I am, is that as you have a junior, you have probably had to fill out that form that you have to fill out about what a parent has to say about their kids. So the the. the the people downstairs in guidance have you fill out this form. And you have to, the first thing they ask you is you have to come up with three adjectives, well, three words, that you would use to describe your child. Now, how anyone boils down their child into three, three words. words is absolutely beyond me. <laughs> but I found it a useful method because, as always, you can never, you never can get in everything you want to say about someone. And so I, I applied the same thing to you. I didn't, make, I didn't fill out the whole form for you. <laughs> but I decided that what I was going to try to do was come up with three adjectives. So, Liba, the three adjectives I chose for you, or I would have chosen for you in this form, are the first is courageous. Not that you charge into dangerous situations, although I do not doubt that you would if need be. But more than that, you have the courage of your convictions. You don't stand down when it is something you believe in, and you have helped me to see many different sides of things that I never would have if you hadn't been willing to stand up and make me listen. The second adjective I chose for you is passionate. Your thoughts and feelings on things run deep and are rooted in all you know and have learned. You inspire me to find my passions. And the third adjective I chose for you is focused. And I think that that's probably what you've heard everyone say is you have an ability to see through issues with a laser-like focus that I admire. Mm. It is easy in discussions to lose sight of the point, but I find that you often pull us back to remember what it is we need to be paying attention to and what we don't. Liba, I will so miss you sitting here <laughs> with us and lending your insight and your voice. But I also know that you won't sit silently by, so please, let us know what you're thinking. Watch occasionally. Check in. Tell us when we're goofing up. Um, and I wish you the best of luck in everything that you do. We will miss you horribly, but I am so proud to have served with you on this committee. Thank you so much. Well, now that your head is this big. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to knock me down the side. No. <laughs> I have a diploma for you from all of us, from the Arlington School Committee, to anyone who wants to read this. <laughs> Greetings. Lee Bahayim. Having honorably fulfilled all the requirements imposed by the citizens of Arlington, both real and strange, and upon <laughs> recognition of surviving members of the committee who take no responsibility or liability for future performances of this graduate, we hereby bestow Master of Freedom, 
with all the right to do whatever you want on the second and fourth Thursday of the month. <laughs> or first and third, if you have your right. Well, or first and third. If I, with that goes this very, very expensive trophy. <laughs> Leba, some bizarre fate has always had a woman by my side during many things. You've all met my poor wife for 45 years. I don't know what this committee thought of a Joe, because he was the chair at that time, but you got stuck with me when I first came in, and I remember a lot of nights, you shh, shh, shh. <laughs> this is rather personal. You may decide to open this and read it. I will ask you to read it at least. <laughs> this is for me, from my heart. Thank you. There's no money, so just open it. No, you got, you got to open it now. You got to open it right now. See if there was crazy glow. Open it right now. <laughs> you know, open it. She okay, already knows. Open it now. She knows. And it's you can read it if you choose. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring the glue, but it is a repair kit with Formica oh. for the public to know that Libra would sit there and there is a piece missing on that part of the counter. Oh, well. And I would always say, Libra, Libra. And all of a sudden, one night she was sitting there with a big piece of it in her hand. It finally came off. Libra, I will, say, will definitely miss those nights. <laughs> Bill has just let out my secret of how I can maintain composure. <laughs> I wonder how that works. It does not. <laughs> Thank you, Libra, for that Thank first year. You, did, you, you kept me under control, whether Joe knows that or not. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just want to wrap up uh, our school committee part of the uh, appreciation of Liba tonight with a see you soon rather than a goodbye. Um, I first met Liba in 2008. I was impressed by your energy, your knowledge, experience, and education. I admired your willingness to serve the community on the school committee, and she won. She won her very first race, and I knew she would be tough to beat, and she was. Uh, but how fortunate I was to steal your campaign manager, Mark, away from you. You referred to it as our bromance <laughs> and um, tried to follow in your footsteps. And I've worked with you on policies and procedures, on budget. I saw your amazing resilience, resiliency and foresight moving us <clears throat> towards redistricting. As Jeff mentioned, certainly a very controversial issue for many school boards, but one that was necessary. And you saw the way and approach to that. Um, so Leba, thank you very much uh, for your service here and your friendship. And one of the outside moments I was able to share uh, was in Princeton, New Jersey, at Mark's wedding. And I saw you dance and cut up a rug. So I thought of you as a rock star. So this is my rock star trophy. <laughs> it's got a big guitar on it. I've got something else, though, too. A few other things. He's a prop man. Props. I love props. props. Yeah. He loves props. You're going to ride off into the sunset, so it's a little little riding off into the sunset hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. and, and matches. It matches my hat back. Yep, there you go. Well, I left the tag awesome. on, just like my grandma. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> we got... Your, uh... <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Oh, match. Look, it fits. That's awesome. And there's strings on it, just like the duck hat. <laughs> yeah. it, it matches her outfit tonight. Yeah. Okay. And from, from all of us here, uh, Rob's bringing us in right now, reinstituting an old tradition. Um, we can put it up front here. Put it, yeah, right up front. Wait. We'll make you sit in the middle for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> like the deck and chair? Like oh. a roast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is uh, your very own school committee parting gift, your, your chair. Your With chair. your name on it. Mm -hmm. Your name, the seal of the town, your years of service. It's not like born dot. No, it's not <laughs> like that. <laughs> it says Lee Beheim, 2008 to 2014. Um, take it as just a small token of our admiration and, mm -hmm. and love for you and what you've done for the town. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. I don't know if you all I, had a few uh, words to say. To I you. would like to say a few yes. words. Um, deep gratitude. I, Aliba has been a tremendous supporter, not only of me, but of the schools. We've gone through a lot of difficult moments and difficult times, but also some really great collaborative times as well. And I think that Everyone has mentioned what you've brought to the committee. I would echo all of it. The perspective you have coming to the committee as a mother, 
a teacher, administrator, has been in, hugely important in really helping us keep focused on what is the most important thing that we do. And it's very easy to get off that, that view, but you, you have been excellent at keeping us focused. And I love your laugh. And we're going to miss that laugh. <laughs> you really can laugh with your whole body, which is fabulous. <laughs> But it's really been um, a very, it's been a very great professional relationship and personal relationship to know you. And I, and I certainly hope that there'll be m many more times that we are able to collaborate going in, in the years ahead. And I also want to say thank you for being on the redistricting committee because there have been moments when you were just invaluable in being able to give really important perspectives <coughs> and uh, to be able to to you know, help me think through some of the issues as we went along, but it was it was very I think it was a it was a great committee, and we got finally to a wonderful result um, that I think will make a, a, a huge impact in the years ahead. Especially as we, our enrollment just keeps growing and growing, I think that we'll we'll see the positive effects of that. But I have deep admiration for you, uh, and I I am very sad that you're going to be leaving here. It doesn't seem quite possible after all these years. But I only wish you well um, in all that you do. Um, we haven't known each, I haven't worked with you as long as some of the other folks, but I can tell from the last two years that the children in the schools of Arlington have no greater friend nor ally than you. Uh, you are a great friend in the terms of the, the love and the passion you show for our children and a great ally in the way you fight for the needs of our children. And I want to thank you for your support. I will echo that and thank you for uh, welcoming me when I came three years ago to Arlington and my position and the role that um, of human resources uh, that was brought back to Arlington and uh, it's been your experience and negotiations has been very helpful to me so thank you very much and best of luck okay, now I think uh, mr. Hainer has a I'd motion. like to make a motion to recess in order to prepare the room for the middle school students presentation we will return in approximately 15 minutes Second. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are all those against? We are recessed for 15.
Yeah. Do, I do. really want to do that. <laughs> Good evening, uh, and we are back after a short recess. Um, we have a very special presentation here this evening uh, that I'm particularly delighted about uh, being an amateur thespian myself. Um, Guys and Dolls has got such a rich history, and pretty, pretty much everyone in this room probably knows at least one song, and we are delighted to have the cast uh, of Guys and Dolls here tonight from uh, the Audison Middle School. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Kirshner, who has a few words to say before uh, you're going to present. So if you wouldn't mind coming to the mic. and Thank you. Good evening to Mr. Judson Pierce, Chair of the School Committee, all School Committee members, Dr. Bodie, Dr. Chesson, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Spiegel, Ms. Fitzgerald, and the Arlington High School student representative. On behalf of those involved in the, this production of Guys and Dolls Jr., I would like to thank you for inviting us to perform. We are a small group representing the larger cast and crew of 75 children involved in this musical. Guys and Dolls Jr. was performed at the Audison Middle School on March 6th and 7th by a talented group of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders to an audience of more than 735. It was a great success, and we're very thankful for this incredible opportunity you have made available to us. Guys and Dolls Jr. is a fast-paced and comedic musical. In the scene you will see today, Miss Adelaide is confronting her longtime beau, Nathan Detroit, following yet another postponement to their wedding due to his running of the oldest established permanent floating crap game in New York. <laughs> we will then follow with the show's finale. Over 150 people, Arlington residents, Audison teachers, elementary staff, high school students, parent volunteers, and younger siblings came together to make this musical reality. We have learned through this experience that it truly takes a village to produce a musical. And it's through this incredible process we have built a community. We thank you for your support, time, and we hope you enjoy these two selections. Thank you. Adelaide, did nicely, did nicely explain to you about tonight? I hope you're so about it. Please, let us not have a vulgar scene. We are civilized people and we do not have to conduct ourselves like a slob. Sweetheart, baby, how can you make such a big fuss over one lousy elopement? It is no use, Nathan. I have succeeded in your not being able to upset me no more. I have got you completely out of my... Don't do that to me. I can't stand it. We love each other. We're gonna get married. We're gonna have a little white house in the country with a green fence, like the Whitney colors. Look, Nathan, we can still make everything all right. It's not even midnight yet. Five minutes to 12. Let's elope right now. Okay, Adelaide. Oh. No. I can't. Nathan. Why can't we elope right now? Well, the thing is, I gotta go to a prayer meeting. Nathan, <laughs> this is the biggest lie you ever told me! But I promise you, it's true! You promise me this, you promise me that, you promise me anything under the sun, and you give me a kiss and you're grabbing your hat, and you're off to the races again when I think of the time!
second uh, curtain call because we've got a lot of cake that's <laughs> left over from recess. So please come back for the cake. I just really wanted to thank all of you for coming so much. Thank the parents here who've uh, supported them through their artistic endeavors. I will really, really want to thank Corey Gaffney, Laura, Laura Kirshner for introducing it, Jen Fernandez, and Greg Kondikes of the Audison Middle School. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful work. Amazing actors and singers. Um, Thank you so much for making my last meeting as chair um, to start out like that. <laughs> serious about the cake, though. <laughs> it's hurting. Is um, should we take it out in the hall for them, maybe? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Karen, let's get that ready. Karen, let's get that ready. Let's get that school members to cut You want to get that ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You too. Take yeah, it. you too. Obama School Committee members. Sean yeah. and Joe, you got to cut up the cake. You're going to cut up the cake. You're going to do it. Awesome. Um, I don't know if anybody's signed up. Miss Muse in this room. We're good. You're going to play? That was fun. Feel free. Oh, fuck. I'm sorry. Well, you, I just wanted to help out. I noticed. Still, we all have to sign it up. Otherwise, that would be great. Otherwise, it's a pain in the neck to fund the tape. With great affection. It's, it's what we should. You're our public Thank servant. You. Thank you. I'll sit here if you. Our esteemed okay. public servant. Uh, I'd like to. I, I've been. If it, it'll work from here. It's been suggested to me that if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected and become the new chair, somebody would like to have a musical school committee meeting. So. I didn't mean. I didn't mean that we would be in a musical. <laughs> Anyway, there's a new YouTube thing on happiness. You know the happiness. We can try oh, to do yeah. that one. <laughs> Happy. You, know, you see that, that, that Detroit Happy. Dance Academy? Yeah, we yeah, should yeah. try to do the dance. That see how we do. Fun, yeah. Whoa. Let's work it out. We've got some time. All right. Before we get started, <laughs> this is uh, no public participation. Um, no public participation. The public. <laughs> there is <laughs> there's no, no public. <laughs> we, we <ain't> <laughs> A lot of, a lot of participation. Went from a lot of right. public to no public. To no. What we should do is have a cake every meeting yeah, so the public follows it out of the room, you know? Yeah, there you go. Um, this, is, this is my last opportunity to uh, speak some words from this seat. Uh, so maybe we could um, shut the door just for a little bit. Yeah. Well, they're just taking out the music, though. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You the got music. It. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to recognize the tragedy that occurred in our fine city of Boston last evening. Uh, two brave men were killed in the line of duty, Boston firefighters Michael Kennedy and Lieutenant Ed Walsh. And let us remember how these brave men and women, our first responders, put their lives on the line for us every day. I'd like for each of us to hug our loved ones tonight and call them on the phone and say that we love them. May we have a moment of silence for Michael Kennedy and Edward Walsh, please. Thank you. Folks, tonight I echo what I said in my first remarks as chair on April 9th of last year. I'm proud to say that our schools are strong and are preparing our children for a college education and beyond. The credit goes around to our administration, to my colleagues, to the teachers, our staff, and our community. We each in some way contributed to our town's ongoing success as we strive to educate the whole child, each and every child. Bill, You've done so much in your three years on the committee that I've known you, including initiating the Kindergarten Review Committee that eventually led to the elimination of the kindergarten fee. Cindy, you've done so much in your role as budget. I mean, I can't even speak enough about what you did this year in terms of getting the communication out there early enough for our town leaders and our community to know really about the pressures we were fight facing due to over-enrollment over the years. Jeff and Paul, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm pushing you guys together on this one. You're our senior members. <laughs> Not senior moments, but senior members. <laughs> huh? Wait, let me turn up your. I can't. I can't. <laughs> your historic. Speak into the machine. <laughs> <laughs> your historical memory and experience in the fields of education and policy are the heart of this very committee. Leba, we've already gotten to you. <laughs> and more where you came from. There's more where that came from. Kiersey, you have done so much in the way of analytics and asking the right questions at the right times and saying it the right way and staying on top of the high school and Stratton facilities, the middle school math scores, 
your recent hard work on the statement of interest that just went to the MSBA uh, yesterday on our high school rebuild uh, request, Leba. Again, I can't thank you enough for your hard work and your resilience and sitting through all my speeches. <laughs> That's why I take some exception, folks, to the article in Monday's Globe. It was written by James Vasmus. He quoted our um, commissioner, state commissioner of elementary and secondary education, Mitchell Chester, who said, there's no question we need to accelerate our progress to go from good to great. So if I hear from, let's go from good to great one more time, I think I'm going to go quietly sit down inside the school committee room and have a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Though Mr. Chester was rebutting the accusation that employers were asserting that Massachusetts schools were not producing students who were employable, as I understood his point, the solution was more state and educational leaders forcing regulation. That there exists a need to put their imprint on education policy to keep up with other countries. The expression, too many cooks in the kitchen, comes to mind. I believe this is what we have going on in education policy today. Too many folks in Washington building their next election victory on the issue of education. Too many folks here in our Commonwealth justifying their job status by saying we need to break what is not broken and to the detriment of our teachers, our students, and their families. I've recently started watching the new Netflix series, House of Cards. Oh, isn't that awesome? <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. I love it. I'm yeah. addicted. And only four episodes in. Oh, but so far, so much, so much content. Content. education policy has made the centerpiece of the president's first 100 days. But in the series, at least so far, the president has no idea how to fix education, nor do the members of Congress. They all just believe that it is the issue that can get people behind, as everyone cares about children. Indeed, you see horse trading around centerpieces of ed reform, such as the period of time to conduct teacher evaluations and give backs and trade-offs in charter schools versus public schools. If this fictional depiction is even remotely true, and I have no reason to believe it isn't based on some reality, it's deplorable. I've spoken with our AEA president, Linda Hansen, on this broad topic, and we agree. Teachers care about things such as small class size, IT support, troubleshooting, clean classrooms, emotional support, and social support for children, photocopy machines that work. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chester and our leaders, I ask you, can we do these things well first and save the going from good to great bit for another century, please? I think what we're all achieving here is great. We see evidence of that every day in our nine schools. I wonder, do they? We as a school committee, as we enter into our annual goal setting time and our annual reorganization, must recognize our part in this too. I do not mean at all to absolve us and blame it all on our two hills, Beacon and Capitol. We must remain mindful not to further increase the number of cooks in an already overcrowded kitchen and keep it as simple as possible. What choices we make, what assessments are implemented that we are holding teacher, teachers responsible for, all have a consequence. The surprise is that it is often not what we wanted to have happen. That's my last speech awesome. as chair. Um, you're going to miss doing that. <laughs> But uh, moving you, on. You can write for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have some more meeting to go. We are on the pilot on partnership for assessment of readiness of colleges and careers. Park. And here to present on this subject mm -hmm. is our assistant superintendent, Dr. Laura Chesson. Um, the school district will begin, uh, as many other school districts are currently underway or will begin, um, a pilot of PARC, which is intended to be the replacement for the MCAS test. And I just wanted to talk a little bit, very briefly tonight, about the, uh, this might not work. I might have to move. Let me move down. There you go. Oh, yeah, you got it. Fine. We spent too much time getting ready for park today and not enough time in here checking out the technology in here. Um, 
I wanted to just briefly talk about MCAS and the high school graduation competency determination so folks know where we're coming from. Talk about an overview of PARC um, and uh, the two-year transition plan from PARC to MCAS and then we'll be glad to take questions. Um, so as we're all aware, uh, the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System um, was put in place and all students who are educated with public funds, uh, including students who are, have disabilities or limited English proficiency, um, must take the MCAS. And we receive reports um, based on individual students, schools, and district performance. Um, this sh uh, slide shows you um, where each uh, curriculum framework was adopted and where there was revision. You notice that in mathematics and English language arts, there were major revisions in 2011, and that is when we adopted the Common Core State Standards. Um, and you'll see uh, there will be a change probably within the next year or two in science and technology engineering as Massachusetts uh, looks at the next generation science standards and decides uh, how they will modify those to meet the needs of Massachusetts. Currently we're having a transition towards new more rigorous standards and this is something that we've talked about many times. The Common Core State Standards, particularly in the areas of English Language Arts and Literacy and Math. And you'll see here um, how we rolled out this implementation. Uh, we first introduced the standards in um, 2012. In 2013, uh, the MCAS test tested those things that were in common from the two sets of standards. And in 2014, we'll have the full implementation. Now, we have aligned our curriculum to the Common Core State Standards, but as we see, as we start talking about PARC, it is more than just the curriculum, but it's also, also the instruction that needs to match that. So the vision for PARC, um, it's a next generation of assessment. Uh, Massachusetts was one of three states to uh, focus on this. And um, the early discussions and planning revolved around state-driven initiatives partnering with other states. So one might ask, given the words that we've heard tonight, why do we need a new assessment? Um, the current assessment the, uh, does test some parts of the Common Core State Standards, but really there's been a significant shift um, in priorities in what is included in the new Common Core Standards, and Massachusetts needs to come up with a new assessment system that would be aligned to that. And MCAS would need significant changes to be fully aligned with those standards. So the focus on the standards. Uh, the park will have a summative assessment, will focus on either grade level or course specific standards, grade level uh, K through eight, and course specific when we start looking at um, things like uh, math, uh, algebra, geometry, uh, algebra two at the high school level. It will include for the first time what's called performance-based assessments, and actually we will have two schools that will be piloting those performance-based assessments, and we'll talk in a minute about what those are and what the differences are. And these will provide opportunities for students to demonstrate skills and abilities where we are not currently able to do that. In English language arts, the PBA, or the performance-based assessment, we'll have three sections. The first section is on literary analysis, where students will not only have to answer questions, but will have to um, tell where they profound the evidence in the um, text and answering their questions. Narrative writing will call for students to read a piece of writing and then write an original piece of writing that is inspired by that piece of writing. And a research simulation will require students to watch video, listen to audio, do reading that might be of a fictional nature and then reading of a non-fictional nature all about the same subject and then take information from each of those sources and analyze it and synthesize it and respond to it. And in the math, we'll be looking at real life modeling and applications. So these are some things that are very different from the current assessment that we have now. So what does the field test look like in Arlington and across the state? Approximately 15% of the students in Massachusetts in grades 3 through 11 who were selected randomly, they sent us a list of the students in which class, uh, of the schools and which classes in those schools and what tests they would take and whether they would take computer-based or paper and pencil tests. There are two fairly wide windows, the first one for the performance-based assessment in ELA and math and the second one for EOY or the end-of-year assessments also in English language arts and math. 
in Arlington. When we look at the performance-based assessments, which will be happening in the next two weeks, we will have them in two schools. Audison was selected to have two seventh grade English classes do a computer-based assessment um, on this performance-based assessment. And they will be testing on April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. At Dallin, two of the fifth grade classes were selected also to do the performance-based assessment in ELA, and they will be testing on April 7th, 8th, and 9th. One of the things that I'd like to call to your attention is that we will not be getting any scoring information. The scoring information, we will not receive scores based on the student, based on the school, or based on the district. This pilot is simply to provide information to the test designers and implementers about the strengths and the weaknesses of the test, the procedures, and the items on the test. We'll then ha be also be participating in the end of year testing, which will come in the May to June timeframe. This time we'll have three schools involved at the elementary level and one, and also at the middle school, we'll have two grades involved. At the Bishop, two fifth grade classes will take the mathematics test and it will be paper-based. At the Dallin, two fifth grade classes, the same two fifth grade classes that we just saw for the performance-based assessment will take the English language arts computer-based test. And at the Thompson, two fourth grade classes will take mathematics again paper-based. At the Audison, grades six and eight will uh, participate in the end of the year test in mathematics. Uh, in grades six and eight, both of the classes will be taking a computer-based test. How did we prepare our students? Because we want our students to be able to participate in a way that will make them feel like they're contributing to this process to help make the test, which will uh, probably go across the entire district next year, is something that's still under consideration, but looks like that will be the direction that we'll go in, to provide information so that they and their peers will have the best possible experience next year. So we've had techno uh, technology and curriculum leader training is currently underway. Classroom teacher training is also underway. Uh, student uh, training was held uh, this week at Dallin. Um, they tested on the iPads and they looked at the test items. They looked at how um, the, the, to go from page to page. How do you flag an item if you want to go back to it? Um, how to use the different uh, tools that are available. You, in some places, the, the words are underlined and students can actually ask for a definition of those words. They were trained on, on all of those things. And next week on Monday, uh, Audison will also be trained. And at, at Audison, we'll be using um, desktop PCs. Letters were sent home by the principals of the affected schools that are a part of the pro, uh, performance-based assessment this week. And similar letters will be sent home to those affected students when we get to the end of the year testing. And this is a website that's in your packet that you could actually go out and uh, do some of the sample questions. We would have done them tonight, but the internet in here for some reason doesn't seem to be working, which is why we have, we'll have all hands on deck on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. Um, almost every member of the technology staff, myself and Susan Bisson, who's uh, our database person and tech integration specialist, will all be located at Audison so that we'll have all the supports that we need to have a successful pilot test next week. Are there any questions? Mr. Hanger? Uh, are we, I heard you say that we're, we're, we're field testing. Are we field testing to determine if the test itself is actually covering the Common Core? Is that part of the field testing? Well, they will have enough data from the state of Massachusetts that they'll be able to look at that. And actually, Massachusetts is not the only state that's currently field testing PARC. All of the PARC states are also field testing it. So that is one of the things that they're taking a look at to make sure that there's what we would call validity so the test is testing what it says it tests. What do we get out of it besides having a chance to see what the test is like, a practice? Did, was there any other incentive provided by no, the state? No, that was the only incentive provided okay. by the state. And my last one, as far as the training that you mentioned for the students and the, and the faculty and stuff, is there a, a specific or a a national recommended training, or is it just what we fly by the seat of? I, no, they I, I actually. I don't mean. No, to no, no. I know. It. I know what you're asking. We actually have a tutorial that's provided by the state. 
um, or by the Park Consortium by Pearson, I have to say that we looked at that tutorial and found that it was not at an accessible level for grade five, and we've heard the same um, concerns from other school districts. So we, based on that, we've made our own training session, um, and we're probably going to do the same thing for sixth grade, is to use the module that Susan's created. Um, and the park people have heard loud and clear that the Pearson training module is not really accessible to students. My last question is the uh, next year, is the start of this, uh, it, it will be implemented next year? That's currently the plan, but it, has, it hasn't been voted on yet by the State Board of Education. Do you know if the state is going to provide us any monetary assistance to deal with the technology? There, there is currently no plan to do so. Nothing in the works at all. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Just uh, so a couple of questions. To clarify, we have transitioned to the Common Core in math and ELA K through 12. That's correct. Um, and there, are, there have been, in other districts and other states, there have been a lot of uh, rumblings about the Common Core, a lot, of, a lot of discontent with it. We don't seem to have that experience in Arlington. I don't, I don't sense mm -hmm. that. I, I, I have not heard. I, I, I have not heard that. We have actually, and, and yeah. the two speakers after me will um, actually talk about district determined measures, but in your packet, there is also a copy of the, um, or there should be a copy of the presentation that they did with one of the grades on, on Park and the Common Core and how to get teachers ready for it. I think that our teachers are looking at particularly the areas of informational reading and writing, uh, using mathematics for modeling, uh, and looking at taking information from a variety of sources and synthesizing it, and teachers are saying, yes, this is the things that my students need to do. As a matter of fact, those are very much um, modeled after what's required for the AP exams. So, I mean, it, I, I've heard p complaints but we, we, from other states, but we, we have not felt that here. Good. I, I just wanted to get that point across, that that's not been the experience. No, that's case. not been our experience. Uh, teachers do see it as a challenge. Um, and it, the way that um, it's necessary to handle classroom instruction will be, so when we say we've adopted the Common Core, yes, we've adopted, we've aligned our curriculum, but we're, we're moving forward with um, how that instruction plays out in the classroom. And there is always a transition period with any new curriculum. It's never Absolutely. perfect even uh, when, it, when it's introduced. No, it can always be better. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Schlecker. Thank you. Um, I, I think that yeah, I don't want to get into the park because, I mean, we're just starting into it and playing with it. But a couple of points I want to make. Number one, the department has released its testing schedule for next year, and they're releasing MCAS testing dates. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is is that the park you know, is, is a noble effort, but it's not ready for prime time, and I think the department doesn't see it as being ready for prime time next year. Uh, they may change that, but right now they're planning for MCAS testing and telling us when to block off our calendars so that the MCAS can be. I, I understand that that information was given out, but in the training sessions that I've attended as recently as three weeks ago, there was no intimation that the park would not be an option for schools to cho school districts to choose mm -hmm. next year. I mean, I think we have to, to take a look at what it looks like. And, and the other thing is, is that the reason why so many classrooms have to take this as a pilot is what they're trying to do is check out for the correlation between MCAS mm -hmm. and PARC to make sure the metrics okay. are correct so that uh, <clears throat> we're measuring the same thing. So that all of a sudden a proficient score on MCAS doesn't turn into a needs improvement or advanced score in, in, in PARC so that it doesn't shift that much. Uh, from from where we are, and if the metrics are, are totally wrong, I think we, we, you know, the state will take issue with it, and not not play with it next year. I mean, it, it's a big trial, and the technology that's been involved has been amazing. We were at the same seminar, and they were taught spent half the seminar talking about backup servers and downloading and t uh, download caching and and all sorts of stuff that that is techno technologically advanced for a humble school system that's focused on teaching and learning mm -hmm. to, to get their hands around. So uh, I think the uh, issue of unfunded mandates surrounding the, the park test is, is problematic, even though it seems on the face of it to be progressing towards a better measure than, than, than the uh, last century technology of 
packing stuff in a box, shipping it off to and waiting New, three months. New Hampshire and waiting till September for right. the result. I, I want to caution us that while it tests the same content as the MCAS did last year because it's based on the Common Core State Standards, um, the type of task that it's asking students to do are dramatically different mm -hmm. from the MCAS. So I'm not sure whether it's going to be an apples to apples comparison when we start looking at metrics after the fact. Yeah, it may not be. I mean, it's much more performance based so that uh, if you disaggregate out, say, the open response section of the MCAS, it would probably relate more to that per se yeah. than to the rest of the test, yes. which makes it, I think, a better measure of what a child can do mm -hmm. rather than how a child tests if done well. But we're not going to know that until after the, the pilot cycles are through and we get a sense of how kids are responding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cody? Uh, well, I just wanted to, um, t I think one of the reasons why they gave the MCAS schedule out is that th there still remains a possibility there may be a choice in this, but the 10th grade is going to continue taking MCAS for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, it's only really going to be K-8 mm -hmm. that are going to do park. And one of the things they're asking superintendents to decide this summer is whether if you if you're doing park, mm -hmm. are you going to do park with in technology mm -hmm. or are you going to do park in paper? And it's it's an either or choice, and that's actually one of the things that may come out. They may not reveal this in their their um, uh, the pilot, but they are looking to see if they can hold some variables constant. Does it make a difference in terms of performance on particular questions mm -hmm. if they do it on paper or by technology, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure we'll have that information before we have to make a decision about that, but it is an issue, and it's, I would be I encourage you to go up and look at this because it's really quite um, significant in terms of the kind of technology skills that students need to have in order to be able to just even answer the question. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I thank um, Dr. Chesson for the and, and Susan Bisson for the training they've been giving both teachers and students because I think without that it might have been rather very difficult mm -hmm. to have been given this test and have no no experience on it. You know, ultimately, to do it in technology, you could be iterative and ta uh, tailor the test to the level of the student as they go into it, rather than having to ask all the questions mm -hmm. of every student whether they're tracking towards a low score or a high score. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be a more efficient, uh, less time-consuming practice for a school district to be giving the an electronic test if done well and we don't know if we're going to be there uh, right, right. The, the kinds of um, questions that they're asking the performance based assessment I'm not sure how you would do that mm -hmm. by paper and pencil test because the students are having to watch video they're having to listen to audio um, so it's really geared towards that and um, I think that th while our students were perhaps a little ap apprehensive as we went began the test uh, training um, we trained the elementary students and after you know four or five minutes they were kind of like oh yeah this looks like this app that we use this looks like this when we do this and that so we, we had so far we have a good response now we'll see when we get into the testing cycle but Dr. Allison. I had just a couple questions sort of about mechanics so I had understood that children would only be have to do two hours of a test but the test is April 1st 2nd 3rd so are they doing it each day two hours each day for three days so six hours yeah it's really an hour's worth of test there's 10 minutes of sign on when students come in for the online portion the, the test takes about an hour is what the state is allowed but we're adding an additional hour should students feel like they need extra time because we don't want students to feel stressed by not having enough time to do the test okay so, so it's really an hour's worth of testing. But three times. But three times. And at the end, actually, I just want to add that, this, that the designer, test designers have put in surveys for students. So the very last thing that they'll do is to take a survey regarding their experience. OK. That actually kind of jumped to my other question. I'll come back to that. But so why, do, why are these Dowan kids having to take it twice? Um, they were randomly selected to take the performance-based assessment in the middle of the year, which is now, and the end-of-the-year assessment at the end of the year. Okay. It just seems like they're ending up with an awful lot of testing this year. I mean, an awful lot mm -hmm. of testing, and I'm not real keen on that. Um, so 
getting to the other thing, the survey question sounds sort of in mind. I was wondering what is our district going to do to, uh, to me it seems like it would be a stress relief to the kids to know that someone's asking them how did the test go and how can we make it better for mm -hmm. you and what did you understand. So the survey questions sound like one thing. Are we getting that information back from the test? We will not survey? be getting that information back from the test, but I have already arranged with both of the schools that are doing the first test mm -hmm. that, we're, that I'm going in to meet with the students right before the test. So they're having this training with mm -hmm. Ms. Bisson, but I'm also going to go in right before the test to remind them that this, you know, while we ex would like them to do their best because the most the better the information we get, the better the test will be in the end. But to let them know that it's, you know, they shouldn't be stressed about it. There's not going to be a specific score. They can't fail. It's not like MCAS where they're going to get a warning or a proficient or advanced. But by the same token, I want to let them know that we'll be coming back to them at the end of the test. And here in this district, mm -hmm. we would like to hear from them right. about how they thought the testing um, part was. And I know that at least, and I'm sure that Dallin's doing the same thing, but I just happen mm -hmm. to have this conversation with the folks at Audison today, is that they're going to plan like a little celebration for these kids for participating in this okay I'm, I'm glad about that but so are you you're going to have sort of a focus group to talk about yes. how the test mm -hmm. went and things yeah. okay yeah. so so they're definitely being surveyed yeah. because oh, I, oh, I for think their that's teachers who know them know them well but also to, sure. I'm gonna be there too yeah mm -hmm. I just think that will be very helpful to them yeah we want to definitely debrief with them and, okay. and make I think it, it also raises the bar for what in terms of how important it is that they what what they have done right exactly that part of what I'm thinking Any other okay questions? Mr. Uh, <clears throat> have they talked about any allowances for uh, students that have disabilities you mentioned they're going to watch videos or, or hear things yeah there, you... there's the same accommodations that are available now it just so happens that this the classes that we're testing um, there's some very standard accommodations small group setting um, clarification of directions those are just by random those were the student the classes that were that were selected but there are actually a number of accommodations that are not even possible through uh, a non-computerized based right. test that will be available when this test comes into play last question uh, I know you said we're not getting any scores or any results from this because it's a trial has park or the, the, whoever's instituting this talked about how the scores will be reported out when MCAS started it was initially to to evaluate schools mm -hmm. it, it, that was the lowest level it was supposed to do we've seen a dramatic transition to that uh, they, they haven't really been specific about what the reporting structure will be like I do know that it will all be available online because the option is there but it's grayed out and they actually have a training um, module that tells you about sort of about it but we, we you I know get, we I, I guess what I'm asking is when we get there in yes. the future, are the scores going to be made available to the schools or right down to the parents? My understanding is it will be the same as MCAS. It will go down to the it will go down to the student level, but there hasn't been a definitive statement about that yet. Thank you. I just have one question. Um, I'd like to direct it to to Ms. Foley or, or Ms. Hansen who are here tonight mm -hmm. regarding your impressions from seeing students firsthand every day for years. Your third grade, right, Ms. Foley? Yes. So this is when. MCAS starts in third grade mm -hmm. for what is your view of MCAS past present and potentially future um, what does it help you with your job um, do um, could you just give us a little bit of background for <coughs> someone who's not in the schools every day quite frankly I don't love it um, <laughs> I mean it's uh, third graders in, in a lot of ways in my opinion it's developmentally inappropriate for third graders um, we do get some very good information about how the children are at reading and analyzing um, the text, finding evidence in the text, um, going back, looking. It's, um, I find that the stress level seem, uh, of the children of the classes that I teach, their stress level seems to be increasing every year. Every year I have the kids coming into me with more knowledge of the MCAS from siblings or from hearing about it. With a lot of misconceptions, I just focus on the fact I give them two hours of recess for every day of testing mm -hmm. <clears throat> and tell them that's all they need to really know about. It's two hours guaranteed, and we talk about what that means, and I try to also focus on that with parents, too. Um, but I don't love it. Um, the other thing I do want to just point out, too, that um, uh, Dr. Ampey mentioned about the um, 
about the amount of testing, I also want to point out that ELL students this year mm -hmm. um, have taken a new test mm -hmm. that was a significant time increase in the amount of testing they've ever taken. And are those children also going to be tested? I'm assuming that there would be some ELL students in these classes that are also going to be taking this park assessment. So I would want to point that out too, that that's a significant amount of testing for those children. Um, very, actually very significant amount of testing. Quite unfair in my opinion. I just wanted to share this story because it was a, a busy week for my son last week, this week. I'm sure a lot of us here have children who have been undergoing the MCAS again. Um, a friend of mine uh, giving breakfast to her girl really healthy breakfast she was eating it all up and she was she wanted to be alert she said she wanted to be alert because she was about to take a test that was going to impact her teachers um, staying there and uh, she wanted to give her teacher the best possible chance to stay because she loved her teacher and and uh, so I mm -hmm. it sort of turns the test on its head when I hear that story it it, it becomes a test to um, either retain or say, no, the teacher's not doing his or her job rather than assessing a student's performance. That's my, one of my biggest concerns about the former test, the MCAS test. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Chesson, about it? About using it to determine whether a teacher stays or goes? Um, the district determined measures, which the next presenters will talk about, um, while it provides very important information to us, is the least important part of the teacher evaluation system, in my personal opinion. Um, I think that the conversations that teachers have with their evaluators about how to improve teaching and learning, um, the professional conversations that wouldn't have happened otherwise without this new evaluation system, uh, while it's a drain on evaluators to be in the classes, it's also quite beneficial for evaluators to be in the classrooms as much as they are now. They really truly get to know what's going on in their buildings and to really not only have conversations with teachers, but to be able to provide teachers with the support and assistance that they need. Um, it's never our intention to ever use a teacher's results on an MCAS test in a negative fashion. It's data that, like any other data that we collect, where we sit and we talk about it and we hopefully work together to improve teaching and learning for our students. It's, it's, it's not a stick. We don't use it for that. So great. Moving on to the next topic. Good segue. It's a good se it is a good segue. Um, this is district attorney <coughs> measures. This is uh, common assessments that we're using in district. Um, Dr. Chesson introduced uh, the last part. You might have a part of this as well. Um, Ms. Linda Hansen is here as well, and Evelyn DeRosa. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, please. Thank you. Well, tonight, Linda and I would like to welcome you to the um, State of the Literacy Address. Um, we're, unlike the president, we will take questions during or after, depending on when you have them. Um, what we'd like to do tonight is to talk a little bit about what the district determined measures are for both reading and for writing this year, the kind of data that we collect, and um, what that data looks like um, mid-year this year. Is it this, which one is it? Thanks. So um, for grades, K through two this year, we're piloting um, the DRA, and I think most of you people have heard about the diagnostic reading assessment that we've been doing at the elementary grades for a number of years now. Um, K our district determined measure this year is that one for the younger elementary school kids. Because we don't have something else that goes along with that, that we don't have MCAS at those grade levels, we're actually using a math assessment that the math department will talk about when they come. For grades four and five, we are also using the DRA too, but we do have MCAS. We have their student growth, so we have that that we're gonna use. Looking forward, we're also gonna offer teachers the option of maybe looking at our fall and our winter writing prompts. This year we started with opinion writing and every grade level did it, grades one through five did it in the fall, and we'll do it in the spring. Kindergartners actually did it mid-year, and we'll do the prompt again in the, um, at, in the springtime. We also thought we might offer teachers the option of using their Lucy Calkins writing end of unit scores as a, a district determined measure. Knowing that everyone in the same grade level has to pick 
the same district determined measure and that maybe having more than two is a good thing to see if it's not going so well in one how is it going in um, another one so we're going to meet with teachers and kind of get their input as to what they really want to use um, for district determined measures in the future knowing that they can change those from year to year um, to see what is working for them or what they really think shows how kids are doing and how they're doing in their classrooms. As a way of actually showing parents um, how their children are doing in reading, we used to have this parent-friendly DRA chart that I think turned out to be not so parent-friendly um, and a little difficult for parents to follow. So this year we decided to do a more linear graph. So this would be one child's reading progression. So across the top, it's color-coded so you know that Kindergarten scores are in the red, the first grade scores are in the green, second grade is in yellow and up all the way through. We also marked a mid-year point. So that's where a child should be if they're on benchmark in reading. So in kindergarten, the mid-year benchmark would be a B2 if you look at the DRA levels that go across. Um, in the middle of first grade, it would be an F10, in the middle of second grade, it would be an L24. So you can actually see where they should be at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. On the third line, we actually have the dates of the DRAs. So we give them in June. So this child actually was a C4 in June. And when they came back in September, they were a D6. So their September date is there. This is the perfect child because in the middle of the year, they're an F10, and that's on benchmark. And at the end of the year, they were an I-16. So this, one of the things that we can actually show parents is if there's some summer regression. If they were a, a C4, say, in June, but when they came back, they were a B3. So something to show them about, okay, what do we have to do over the summer? What aren't we doing? Um, obviously, this child was fine with doing that. And we want to make sure that we have every child making a half year's growth not just the kids who came in at benchmark, the kids that are above benchmark, not just hitting that mid-year point, but going beyond that. In grade, oops, sorry, sorry, that's okay. In grades four and five, um, you can see that the, the it's, it kind of looks static. It's a level 40 text for fourth grade. It's a level 50 text for fifth grade. What we're looking at those grades is to see the increase in comprehension and increase in fluency. So if a child comes into fourth grade and they are instructional level on a 40 coming in, we want to see them go to an advanced level by the end of the year, or at least a proficient level, so that their comprehension is getting higher. They're reading maybe not higher level text, but they're reading different kinds of genre and more in depth on those. So we looked this year and we really wanted teachers to look at not just where the scores are or great all of my kids are meeting benchmark, but to really look at what that growth looks like. So looking at having at least a half year's growth. So if you look at, say, a grade one, we know that we want to go from a C4, F10 in the middle, I16 at the end. You'll notice that we have some slashes up there. So it says I-16, J-18. When we started looking at the Common Core, we're looking at maybe trying to tweak the levels that we think should be benchmarks for beginning of the year and end of the year, looking at what those expectations are, then also looking at what the qualities are that are at those specific levels. It looks to us like we really have to think about a C-4 maybe being the end of the year benchmark for kindergarten. That's really consistent with the Irene Fountas um, levels, the tools of the mind levels are all a little bit higher. And districts around us are beginning to look at what those benchmarks should be um, at the end of the year and the beginning of the year. Now, it's, obviously, it's easy to see. If you start at the beginning of the year benchmark at an A, you make a B2, you make a B3, you can actually see that they've made a half a year and then that they've made a full year. It's a little harder to see when they start like at a B3, so they were below benchmark at the beginning of the year, but they made it to an E. So they haven't, you know, what is it that's a half year's growth? 
So we actually put together a little cheat sheet for the reading teachers so that when they were looking at it in the classroom teachers, they could see what that was kind of easily, what was a half of a year's growth. For our reading teachers, we have um, reading intervention planning sheets. So any child that's going to go into reading intervention, um, the reading teachers actually really keep really close track of those kids and actually do more progress monitoring of those kids in between the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year testing. So with reading teachers, again, we wanted them to look at were these kids really making enough growth? So we added a growth column, and you can see that there's a couple, three minuses at the beginning, a couple pluses with kids did make at least, um, uh, made more than a year's growth, and then the equal where the kids made at least a half of year's growth. For these, you also see this is a second grade one, and it actually is one right from a second grade class. And the phonics to coding inventory is actually a phonics skill that matches their foundations. And it's out of a score of 50. So by the end of the year, we want kids to be able to do all 50 of those little phonics skills that are being taught. So at the beginning of the year, you would expect kids in the fall who haven't been taught it, obviously, not to have a high score at the beginning of the year. Um, again, we check for oral reading fluency and comprehension, not just the grade levels. And under our tiers, we have tier two kids, tier 2.5 kids, and tier three. And it really reflects the um, level that they're at in reading, the level of support um, that they need. Um, and that we have, a, we have the assessments done in the fall. We redo those mid-year to see if kids need either more support or less support. And we have these for every single grade level. Again, in the, the spring, we do the assessments again. We kind of plan for what we think mm -hmm. might be groupings um, for the fall, so we can actually see where we need more reading support, where we need less reading support, uh, where things are just going great, uh, or, or where there's a real big chunk of kids who aren't making a lot of progress, and you know, what are we going to do about that? So we use it at the end of the year to kind of pre-plan um, for the following year. So the mid-year data this year, um, this is um, an aggregate of, of the whole town, um, all of the different schools. We do have it broken down by schools, but for you guys, we have um, the whole town. You can actually see that um, kindergarten is about 22% of the kids are below the mid-year benchmark, which would be that B2. Um, we have a good chunk of kids meeting or above that benchmark in kindergarten. Uh, first grade, 14.9, 15%. And again, a good chunk um, of kids who are meeting the benchmark or above the benchmark. And in grade two, 15%. Um, and another really solid chunk of kids who are meeting the benchmark are above. So mid-year is where we really relook at kids, um, exit kids out who are doing just fine, um, either increase support for kids who aren't making that progress, um, or really increase it for kids who haven't made much gain. Okay. So, oh, oops, go ahead. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, any questions about that data? Um, I want to ask you about the previous slide. Okay. Um, where we're seeing um, our students that were above benchmark in, grade, in kindergarten and first grade are higher percentage wise, and then we see that dip. Um, I realize that, that that still means the majority of our students are at or above grade level, mm -hmm. but I do wonder if that represents actually a year's worth of growth on the part of those students that were above benchmark. And, and you would see that if we had every single individual student out in there, you'd be able to tell if that child um, was, say, came in at the F10 and went to a K. Um, you would be able to see that. And we have that on the reading intervention planning sheets, and the teachers can actually look at that on their individual spreadsheets. Um, for some schools, I've done that out, say, you know, if I'm on a with a group of teachers, we have like all of the first grade kids, and we've actually looked at where, where they were 
where they are now. And mid-year, we actually assign them a plus, a minus, or an equal. So teachers knew, you know, even if they came in and they were above benchmark, we want those kids also to make a half year's growth, not just make the benchmark for that grade. And, and that's what I'm wondering, um, whether they have made that half year growth or whether they're making less. Um, how do we, what do we need to then think about to make sure that that group that's already overachieving in terms of what our expectation is that we keep them overachieving and that we don't just, that we don't level? Well, the, the, in each classroom, those kids are grouped by ability for guided reading groups. So teachers are making sure that they're continuing to move them on. So if they came in at the beginning of second grade and they were already reading in M28, teachers are moving them along. They may not be moving them along to the next level text or too much higher because then the, the text itself isn't appropriate for those kids, but they would be doing more things like more poetry, more nonfiction, more writing about their reading, um, those kind of things. Or, or then I guess the, the other question is, is there a level of fluency, mm -hmm. reading fluency that we really don't need to look beyond and then the focus becomes comprehension instead? And that probably is by the time they're at the end of second grade, and the M28 is the first time that kids are asked to actually write, and they have to write a summary. Um, and that's the first time that the questions start to get a little more complex. Uh, and so comprehension becomes more of the focus um, at that point and not actually the, you know, the whole problem of having to decode it and sound it out. So I think the question that uh, Ms. Hyam was sort of going after, um, and pardon me for being somewhat analytical here, but it's, it's just how I look at this, uh, is that, okay, let's say if you have a kid at F10 in, in, in last year, mm -hmm. uh, where's that kid landing right now? So if that kid lands at L24, they've made a year's growth. If the kid lands at K20, they haven't quite made the year's growth. And if the kid lands at M28, they've exceeded a year's growth. Uh, are you agreeing with that Okay, scenario? so if you're talking about a first grader or a second grader, is that what Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm saying first okay. grade to second grade. And I'll just say quite simply, yes, that's exactly the way we're thinking about it. Yeah, so the question we're having, and I think the thing that is not as instructive for us, is how many kids are at or above, because obviously in first grade, the scale is wider, so it's easier to end up at G12. Right, go back to where it was, because okay. I can talk from that. It's easier <laughs> for a kid to end up at G12 in first grade, which is slightly above level, mm -hmm. than it is for a kid to, go, uh, to end up at M28. So the likelihood of being above level in second grade is it's harder to do that in second grade than it is in first, just by definition of the metric. Can I jump in here yeah. for a second? It's really not necessarily, and that's why I wanted to go to this next slide, mm -hmm. because this levels out the, you know, a reading, at first grade it's just divided up, a year's growth is divided up into more discrete, and yeah, I know yeah. that you understand that, and then it's divided up, you know, kind of into less discrete chunks in second grade and mm -hmm. even less in third and so on. So that's really why we came up with this, because this equalizes a half, you know, it enables us to mm -hmm. make the equivalent yeah. between a half year growth no matter where they started. What I think coming back is I don't think it's as informative for us in looking at how many kids are above or at because there may be you know measurement error in there as well in, in the way that they're constructed differently in different grade levels. What I think that I am more interested in and I think that Ms. Hyam is probably thinking the same way is how many kids have made more than a year's growth on a year's growth and didn't quite make the years grow. So, so you're more interested in this sheet yeah. here all the way over to the right, actually looking at if a child made mm -hmm. less than, equal to, or more than a year's right. growth. Right, so that mm -hmm. the summary of that data is more meaningful to us than it did to I tell us how many kids saying. are mm -hmm. above, yeah. uh, above level. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Amber. So I understand how this works for students mm -hmm. who are reading below grade level, mm -hmm. but to tag on what Ms. Hyam said about the kids who are reading at or above grade level, does this mean that we're now assessing what level kids are reading at, even if they're 
above, significantly above grade level? Because that hadn't been my experience in the past. We go up to a year above grade level. So if they're reading, if they're a second grader, we go up till the end of third grade level. So we would go up to a P38. If they're reading above that, that's fine, but, but we really try to, stop assessing. We, okay. we start a year, above, a, a year above, partly because of the type of text that it is, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, but. But a teacher wouldn't be just having the kids read, you know, that no, lower I, I, level, they would be doing. Right, I'm just thinking, you know, if you're trying to, I, I like the idea that you're trying to have everyone get a year of growth. <laughs> it does, in the past what I've seen, it didn't seem like we were doing assessments that we could actually measure that if the kid was at a higher reading level. And I'm still not positive I'm hearing that it is accessible. I guess it would be because you go up to the next grade. Correct. That's right. exactly okay. right. Okay. And, and actually, the, uh, the assessment itself, uh, the directions are to only go one year above mm -hmm. where the child's reading. So that's part of, it's kind of built into the assessment. But that way, you actually allow for at least a year's growth through the testing system. Right. Okay. Yeah. I can explain it some other point. It, it doesn't actually, you aren't actually able to measure, if, if you're not peaking, you know, if you're not actually hitting where they are, you can't tell if they've risen or, or not right. or, or flat. We've but, had okay. many conversations <laughs> yes. about this and we're happy to talk about it more. Yeah. Mr. Hannon. I see this chart here. This chart here would be used for a group of students. Am I correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are the records kept on an individual? So the, if I'm a fourth grade teacher, can I look back and see the, uh, the growth or issues with the child? There are a couple of ways. Right now we have a paper and pencil thing that goes along with the kids every year. Teachers at the beginning of the year get all of the reading scores for their kids from the last year. So Just they, the last year. They have the last year, but they also have a piece of paper that's in a folder, a reading folder, that has everything for that child from kindergarten right. All the way up, a beginning, a middle, and end of year bench. Is, the, is there any thought to do this electronically? Oh yes, there no, is. No, we, we don't want. No, we want to keep it paper and pencil always. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> we would love it to be worked out that way, and we're we're looking towards doing that. We're working on it. Yeah, we're working on it. Yeah. I mean, am I, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but isn't this just basically an Excel spreadsheet? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Film. Two questions. How? How are parents informed of these results? How are, how are we, how do you communicate with parents? Well, the results are on the progress reports that the children get three times a year. The DR, the levels are on there, whether they're on benchmark, above benchmark, or below benchmark. Um, we are looking at changing that progress report. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second question I have is, how do you use the results mm -hmm. to inform professional development mm -hmm. for teachers? So actually, we have several opportunities. It's been a while since we've sat down with teachers and um, you know had to teach them how to use this. It's with the reading, they've been doing them for about eight years now, and they're really good at that. But at data and service review meetings, it comes up as to what are the needs of the students. Um, you know, and we also work with lead reading teachers or lead at grade levels. They'll come to us with, here's what you know, my group of teachers thinks that think they need. Um, we'll have individual mm -hmm. teachers at buildings call us and say, here's what's happening in my class and what can I do? Um, I actually meet with a couple of different grade levels at one building actually every other week um, looking at kids because they had a large mm -hmm. group of kids that were struggling and to look at, you know, what can we do for them and how can we help them move their students along? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, so I'm going to take over for the writing part of the presentation. Um, before I get started here, though, I just want to make a couple comments about um, DDMs in general because we were asked to um, give you an update of not just what's going on with literacy assessments, but how it relates to district determined measures. So um, with my association hat on, I just want to say that we've had a district determined measures joint committee teachers and administrators meeting monthly since the beginning of the year, really just to learn alongside each other what's coming down for the state, from the state related to district determined measures. And I really do want to um, say that we're very much in alignment, I think, between the teachers and the administrators that this whole process really um, should be manageable 
measurable but manageable. It should not be adding a whole other layer of complexity to what we do. And so we've really looked at what the common assessments are in the district and thought about how can we, you know, which one of these, mm -hmm. um, in addition to MCAS scores, do we want to delineate as our district determined measures? Because every teacher needs at least two um, mm -hmm. it, from something that they teach. So we're talking about elementary teachers. So there are actually some choices to be made because you have reading, you have writing, and you have math. So you can pick some combination of those things to be kind of scored for your district determined measures as it relates to the evaluation system. Um, yeah, and so then I guess I would say just finally, the, di the distinction in my mind between a common assessment and a district determined measure is some agreement between the association and the district that these are the things that we're choosing to actually be measured on as part of the new evaluation system. So part of this, um, this is kind of what's out there and then we're having ongoing conversations with teachers so that they understand that these decisions are being made and um, we certainly want to make sure that they uh, have, have a voice in this, and I know everybody feels the same way there. So writing, um, we are using the Lucy um, Calkins units of study uh, in grades one through five. There are narrative, opinion, and informational units as part of this program. Uh, we just want to show you a little bit ap about how it works um, in terms of the scoring aspect of it. This is just a, a, an example of a second grade rubric. This is just for opinion writing. There's different rubrics um, for each different type of writing. So in the yellow stripe down the right hand side there, that's if you're meeting uh, the expectations. And so we have kind of beginning, progressing, meeting, and exceeding the expectations. And each type of writing is broken down into three parts. This is just the structure part of the essay writing. And there are five different components to that. Opinion writing overall, the lead, the transitions, the ending, and the organization. So those all get scored and added up together to equal the structure component of writing. Then we have topic development as another component. And that has to do with elaboration and their ability to use craft. Then we have just language conventions, which is your typical spelling and punctuation. So on a, piece for, a writing piece for the end of the opinion unit, it would be scored on, in all of these different areas, and a student would have, um, would have total score in each area. We'll show you what that uh, spreadsheet looks like in a minute. This is just uh, one really nice thing about uh, adopting the Lucy Calkins writing system of, is they've crafted very thoughtfully well done rubrics that span kindergarten all the way up through eighth grade. So you really can see a progression over time and increasing um, complexity at each level. So this is just one example of opinion writing, just the overall, that first structure category of opinion writing. And you can see how uh, the writing expectations develop over time from, you know, just basically in, in first grade, say the writer wrote her opinion or her likes and dislikes and said why. In second grade, that moves to they wrote their opinion uh, or their likes and dislikes and gave reasons. In third grade, that becomes um, told readers their opinion and ideas on a text or a topic and help them understand the reasons. In fourth grade, write, writing a claim about a topic or a text and tried to support their reasons and so on. So another thing that we do in writing every year is we have what we call an on-demand opinion writing time. So that's where a child is given a prompt and just one time period to sit down and write to that prompt. So I think this year it was 45 minutes. Um, opinion writing is something that's newly emphasized in the Common Core. So it was a new, it's really kind of a new thing that we're focusing on and emphasizing in our writing program. So this was really a, a you know, first run at opinion writing for a lot of these kids. Kindergarten through second grade, the prompt had to do with cho uh, choosing a toy or a, ga a game you like best and write about it, uh, give reasons for why you enjoy it so much, and write an ending. In grades three through five, we asked students to come up with a topic or an issue that you care about or have strong feelings about. They had 45 minutes to write an ar opinion or argument text in which you will state your opinion or claim and explain why you feel that way. 
Um, you can draw on all these different things, but they really don't have a lot of any other physical resources to draw on. It's just kind of their knowledge in their head. So we thought we'd give you a little treat and show you just one sample at every grade level so you can see what that looks like through the grades. So in first grade, this child said, I like to play sorry. It's a fun game. I like that game. Sure. Evelyn did a really good job transcribing this um, into text. Uh, second grade, my favorite toy is a blanket called Taggies. I like her because I've had her since I was a baby. I throw her up in the air and try to catch her again. When I do catch her, I cuddle up with her and suck on her tags. When I am sad, Taggies is there to comfort me. When I have nothing to do, Taggies is there to play with. When I am lonely, Taggies is there to be with me. When I am scared, Taggies is there. I love Taggies. So you can see how this child really was pretty convincing in all the different reasons that they love this Taggies blanket. Third grade. I think third grade should get to play dodgeball in PE. My first reason is it takes a lot of skills we learn in gym class. For an example, hand-eye coordination. Reason number two, the gym has lots of squishy soft balls so nobody would get hurt. Reason number three, I take a lot of exercise like speed and dodging, which would be good exercise. It's also a fun game. I think we should play dodgeball in third grade. Having looked over a lot of these essays, I can tell you dodgeball is a hot, is a hot topic in the elementary schools. Even in fourth grade. This is what you see. This is a fourth grade sample also about dodgeball. My issue here, and I, I won't read the whole thing, but just the top part because people on camera can't um, see these really nice essays. Um, but you can see how the, develop, the essay develops over time, the reasoning, the thinking, the, the giving evidence. My issue is that dodgeball is not played in elementary school, and this paper is to show why dodgeball should be played in school. So there's the lead. My opinion is that dodgeball should be played in elementary school because it helps practice some important skills like focus, hand-eye coordination, throwing, and also movement. So you can see the vocabulary is becoming more sophisticated and more reasons are, are being given. In fifth grade, this is um, an essay about school is very important because if there wasn't any school, everyone would be stupid. So there you go. That's why we're all here, right? Um, first, the human race would become much less intelligent, and second, everyone would only know play and chores, and that would be a bummer. So um, it goes on. It's, it's really a nice essay, though. So teachers take those essays. So these essays were all written 40, in 45-minute, one-shot deals at the beginning of the year where we really haven't been working on opinion writing a lot. You know, I think it'll be really interesting to watch the essays develop after one or two or three years of working on opinion writing and coming up um, each grade. So that rubric that we showed you in the beginning would be scored. So the student's name would go on the left here. This is the kind of data we collect. Um, this would be the structure score, the development score, and the convention score. Again, this is really baseline data. So we have, these are the benchmarks up here. And, you know, you s there, were a, there were a few really great essays, but you see a lot of the kids are, are still developing this skill. Um, we will be doing this same exact prompt at the end of the year, and then we'll have kind of a before and after uh, comparison to take a look at. Um, so one thing, um, Lucy Calkins, Evelyn and I have had the great fortune to go down and hear some of their presenters at Columbia um, on their campus there. And one thing they warned us about, once you introduce opinion writing in the schools, you kind of let loose the floodgates and watch out. You know, everyone, kids have opinions about everything. And now they feel, they're feeling very empowered to write about it. Um, some of the units of study have kids making speeches, writing petitions, so doing opinion writing in all kinds of different forms. Um, but since we're here to talk about common assessments and district determined measures and, and how they kind of relate, this is the direction that we've been going in at the elementary level. It's really about trying to take what we do anyway, what we find valuable, and you know, kind of take a closer look maybe at the data, analyze it a bit more carefully, do some of the things that you were asking us to do a little bit more of, really looking at measuring half year progress, full year progress, measuring progress over time. I think that whole idea is really part of district determined measures. So we're trying to think about how can we use what we're already doing. They're common across the whole grade in the district. That's one criteria. So we meet that. 
We think it's valuable because we were doing it even before the district determined measures edict came down. So how can we take these things that teachers find useful, call them DDMs, and you know, kind of find ways to look at that data that's even maybe a little bit more analytical and a little more useful. Um, so that's, that's the idea. And we'll take any questions about writing or anything else that we've talked Mr. about. Hanner. Do you see an improvement on the, the writing aspects of MCAS as a result of this program? Will we? <laughs> We're well, still pretty I, in early, I would say, really early days of implementation. The, was your question, have we well, seen I it? I guess I, I'm looking at the, uh, the quality of writing that you gave us samples of. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first started teaching in the fourth grade, uh, it was almost like almost two years back from the, mm -hmm. if you, the fourth graders would be, I'd be excited at the second grade level type of uh, presentation. And I'm seeing, from what you showed us here, some, a lot of thinking, a lot of, the process seems to bear fruit. And uh, as I left education, it was starting really to show that what I thought was very mechanical, uh, that you, uh, my students were very expressive in their written words. I think it has a lot to do with, too, you know, they say, be careful what you wish for, be careful what you test, because that's what you get a lot, you know, that, that becomes a goal and an end in itself, so that's what you do a lot of. Right. So I think the MCAS and the advent of the long composition in fourth, seventh, and tenth grade, you know, really bumped up the amount of writing we did at the elementary level, and especially those fourth graders, we had them writing, you know, all the time, long essays. Common Core, I think one of the good things about it, Jeff, you were asking, uh, you know, how people feel about it. People are excited that about, you know, really focusing on not just the narrative anymore, but really focusing on three different kinds of writing. It's more balanced and it, it, speak, it, it meets different kids in different ways. Um, so I think that all the writing that we're doing now and the fact that everyone's going to be assessed in writing and all different kinds of writing, I mean, I, I do think that's one good aspect about it because when you have just a narrative, five paragraph essay kind of being the target, you got a lot of that. And now it's like, well, it could be anything. It could be narrative, it could be opinion, it could be information. You need to be ready for it all. I kind of like that that's not as easily to prep for because it means we just need to go back and focus on good writing teaching. And I think the Lucy Calkins program is really helping teachers just know and understand what good teaching and writing is like. And I think they're excited by all of the variety of things that kids are, are coming up with. One of the, I, I could go on. Go ahead. Right. Sorry, I, I just want to say one of the things that, that it strikes you, and if you go hear their presenter speak, it's almost like drinking Kool-Aid and getting on the program, because <laughs> I went, and I, it was actually very transformative for me, um, was is that the connection between writing and reading, mm -hmm. and that Lucy teaches, in the program, <coughs> teaches uh, certain writing skills or techniques, but then has children explore then, well, now that you've used that, why might an author want to use that and then connects it to the right. Have you read a book where the author has done that? Well, let's talk about how, why you did it and why the author did it. And you can see uh, teachers being able to take kids from zero to 60 in, in a very short order because of the connections that they make. And I'll just say, I know we're way over our time already, but um, I was in a third grade classroom today that I go into often um, during their writing period and just uh, I'm observing the teacher, I'm working with the kids and just trying to better understand the opinion unit. And uh, you know, we're talking a lot about data and assessment, but mm -hmm. being in the classroom and really seeing how excited kids are getting about their opinion, their thesis topic that they chose, dodge, you know, more dodgeball, why some some designer of, of Minecraft, you know, should have more of a certain kind of thing that they don't have. Why older sisters shouldn't steal things from your room. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just really, that's the excitement and that's the spark and that's what, you know, teachers don't want to lose and that's what all of us in the education business, we want to make sure that that stays front and center, that, you know, kind of that spark and that creativity. Yes, we have to do good teaching. Yes, we have to measure how well we're teaching and how well kids are learning, but we also have to always keep in front of us that the idea about the spark and, and, and things that really you can see kids are engaged with. Dr. Allison Abbott. I had one question. Um, I don't understand if 
we're still doing Lucy Hawkins in kindergarten with the tools program. And I'm just wondering how progressive is the Lucy Hawkins program if we're not still doing it? Is that a problem? You know, what, what, what's happening with I that? about writing in kindergarten um, tools? One of the things we did look at in first grade, they have a if-then curriculum book. So if kids have not been doing this in kindergarten, it has some additional lessons for the teachers to do um, at the beginning of first grade to get them into more narrative. There's a lot of writing going on in a tools classroom. Mm -hmm. A lot of the writing has to do with the stories. I've seen some incredible writing coming out of kindergarten and r incredible vocabulary coming out of kindergarten. There's a little less focus on the narrative and a little bit more maybe on the summary of the story and changing the characters, but there's still a lot of writing. And I think just getting kindergartners to not be afraid to pick up that pencil and get something down on paper, I think first grade teachers can do a little bit of backpedaling and a couple of extra lessons or kind of looking at it that way. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you very, very much for thank you. Thank you. that presentation to us. Very, thank very you helpful. for having us. So the plan, yeah, the plan is that um, each of the curriculum areas will come in and present to you um, what they're doing for uh, district determined measures, but also what they're doing for common assessments and the kinds of things that they're starting to learn about the common uh, from the common assessments. As as you saw, um, being able to be a little more um, finite about what a half year's growth was, what a, um, a full year's growth was, um, is really going to help. As we, especially as we really ratchet up these data meetings as we go along, um, and the block scheduling that we have now at the elementary school makes this very, very important because they're able to look at that flex block and how um, they can use flexible groupings and how teachers can sort of use other resources. One of the things we're providing for teachers is a list of all the different resources that they might be able to use should they need um, interventions during that flex block. Would the people that will be coming in, will they be showing us a uh, similar structure, K to uh, across the grades? Some people are, are showing K to five, some people are showing you know, middle school, some right. people are showing, so there'll be a variety of measures. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And this is the first of four, right? This is the first of four. It's just that the literacy is so structured in terms of uh, points that you're reaching running through the first through five, particularly in grades one and two that you're not going to see this precision in district determined measures that, uh, in other content areas the way you would. I mean, the design is very different because there's sort of a s sequential nature to, to what's happening. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about district determined measures in other areas in terms of growth a little bit differently than, than you're able to do given the extent and the um, relative precision of testing on, on ELA. One thing that uh, it, it bears saying here is that Arlington has been a district for many years that have used common assessments uh, to, to measure student growth. Um, we haven't necessarily used them in the, in the same sense of looking at teacher impact. But um, the effort we're making with respect to uh, district determined measures, which is a, a mandate from the state, has actually been a very I think will be a very positive thing. It's just re actually retooling some of what we, we do to looking at what, what, what is it telling us? Mm -hmm. And after we can look at that and, and have that be a very important part of the kind of data meetings that we're having in all schools, then we can also look at what do we need to do to be supportive of, of teachers. And that is all a very positive positive thing. So the district determined measures, um, Linda Hansen had talked about the committee that we've had this year, we meet regularly on, on this. One of the things that we collectively feel very strongly about is that this is something that teachers have to have a, a major voice in, not only in terms of what the district determined measures are going to be, mm -hmm. but also how we interpret what the impact is. And uh, so that is something that we are working on. I, I think it's something that will evolve over time. It's, it's like anything, it's something, a, a, different, a different lens of looking at how to use common assessments. 
And I will also say we still use common assessments in addition to. It's just identifying these a little bit differently. It's created um, in mathematics more um, less, not that they still don't do unit tests and you still don't do quizzes, but we have more um, bigger slices of, of testing that we can look at larger units of learning that may have occurred. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's good. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I just think I, I can't, I also want to echo and I can't stress enough that we are really working as closely as possible with teachers. Now, when you have a whole bunch of fifth grade teachers together, they may have some varied views as to what should be used for district determined measures. And to some cases, we, you know, a decision may have to be made or by majority or we're not always going to get to the same place by consensus. But we want teachers to feel like they at least had an opportunity to be heard. Um, I just want to commend you and presenters that have gone already on the fact that we are getting a lot of bang from the, for the buck from what we're using now. So when we're looking at our DRAs and we're looking at this district determined measure and we're looking at the writing rubrics, mm -hmm. these are um, examples of good information mm -hmm. about student growth and achievement and what mm -hmm. interventions students need mm -hmm. to achieve and we're also using that as a way to inform how we're viewing our teachers as performing for their class and the level of learning that's going on for that group. And so we're not creating something artificial that then adds another layer mm -hmm. of need and completion mm -hmm. on the right. classroom. Right. We're, we're choosing very mindfully pieces that can give us the most information about the, about the most number of things. I'm so sorry. So, um, you know, that really is thoughtful. It is helping keep our students in this very assessment heavy time from having even another layer of assessments that they feel that um, interferes with the learning of the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Okay, moving on, we have a uh, superintendent's report. I wanted to just give a, a few updates. It's not as much as I've had in the last couple of weeks. Um, I think that one of the things we are very pleased about is that we submitted yesterday the statement of interest to the MSBA. Uh, you've had the, the, the latest version. It's gone through many drafts, mm -hmm. and there's uh, quite a few people to thank for their, their work on this. Um, I've certainly, uh, Diane Johnson and Julie Dunn and Chrissy has been helpful, Amy Spears, the principal of our high school, Matthew Janger and assistant principal Bill McCarthy have been very helpful as we've um, evolved this. And so I think uh, I feel very pleased about it. We're, we've sent not only the, uh, the statement of interest but also all the supporting documents electronically and then we will be sending out um, tomorrow yeah, tomorrow, the, the complete packet. You, you send the hard copy as well as everything. Did you say sometime in the past that we will know within a reasonable amount of time uh, before the, the end of this school year? I'm hoping that we will. Episode? It's very possible they may make some decisions at their May meeting. They meet once a month. And I certainly think that we would know by the summer because this is an annual right. process. and. They, they have to make some decisions as to what group will be going forward. Is there any way to know how many other requests have gone in? <laughs> or whose? I mean, or just or anecdotally, you probably know of some, but. Belmont. <laughs> for the, again? Again. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Has Waltham resubmitted? I did not ask the superintendent, though I saw her the other day, I did not ask her if they were going to resubmit. Do some but school districts submit and then skip a year or two and then resubmit, or do they try to do it sequentially? Well, generally, you would probably do it sequentially just because you can use the same statement of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, after in the, year th in the third year, you would have to change it, mm -hmm. uh, update it. Do they give you feedback if you, if they, if you don't make the cut? Mm -hmm. Do they give you a reason why, or do you just assume there were higher priorities ahead of you? Oh, I'm, we'll certainly follow up with them and ask them why. Okay. Once we have a decision, yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ellis. If, if anyone's interested, Dr. Bodie had pointed out to me that on the MSBA website, it's kind of hidden, but you can actually find statement of interest from other schools in years past. And what I found is, I couldn't find any direct link to years past, but if you just go up in the, in the address window and just change the year, 
it dumps the next set mm -hmm. to you. So you can go back and look at who's submitted. Um, but mm -hmm. the other thing I noticed is that for the schools which are like rolling their application forward, they don't always show mm -hmm. the second year that that school's in there, but sometimes they're picked for the ones that gets, get rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So you, it's not a total data set, but it gives you an idea of who's out there. And it was very, it's very interesting reading. Mm -hmm. Just skimming some of them. And we, we did read the, the high school ones um, in recent years, particularly of interest to the ones that were actually invited in mm -hmm. to a feasibility study just to see what, the, uh, what, the, what they were expecting. And I, and I feel that we've, um, in many, res many respects, exceeded some of these quite, quite a bit. I think, I think we did actually a very good job in, in all of this and it was a, a team effort it's gone through many iterations even since last week mm -hmm. we keep working at it and at some point you just say we're done <laughs> we're there um, but can I, can I take a tangent on the high school certainly uh, I don't usually and I don't think I've ever done this is read something from the Arlington list uh, but th this just really seems like an important facility issue that we think of uh, that, that, that we haven't thought of that we really should address. Uh, and this is an email from a woman named Marja Varia, who was a guest of ours at a school committee meeting about a year ago. And she wrote that her first and last visit to the high school took place last year. I was attending the school committee meeting, and I had a young kid in it with a stroller and a toddler. I entered through the front door and was lucky enough to bump into someone who was attending the meeting too, so I followed her and made it to the room. Trouble started when I had to leave the meeting early with no guide to let me out. I thought I remembered my way, so we started walking hallways and taking elevators only to end up in different dark hallways and different levels of the building. I think I stopped the elevator on every floor and tried every hallway in every floor in an effort to get us out to no avail. 30 minutes or more passed, I did not find a single person the entire time or a sign that indicated the exit. Then hope! We seemed to be on a ground floor and there was a door we could open. So I went through it and found myself inside some sort of patio surrounded by walls and close to the street by a high locked fence. <laughs> Worse, now that I was in the, this patio, the doors would not open again to let me back in. We were literally trapped. At this point, I considered calling the police. Long story short, a group of teens passed by the other side of the fence, and I asked them for help. They ended up finding someone who helped us back in and out of the building. It lasts free, although it took us another 15 minutes of walking to go around the massive structure to reach Mass Ave. I could not understand for the life of me how anyone could find anything in such a place. And that in this email, she is wishing us very, very much well to get a new building. And I think that navigating around the building is, is an issue. But the one thing, you know, I read this and, and it made a lot of sense to me because when you're in the building, the signage is leading you to places, but there's nothing really leading you back to the front door. And the secret to this building, which only the initiated knows, that the main level and the front entrance is on the third floor, not the first. And if you know that and you get in the elevator, chances are you're probably okay. But if you don't know that fact, you could end up God knows where in this building and haven't taken the tour in this building. It is a labyrinth. Uh, so I, I would like to suggest that we, one in the elevator, put a sign in the elevator that says uh, Mass Ave level third floor. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really good idea, and I wouldn't have thought of it because I've been in and out of this building for a long time, for years. And then strategically placed Arrows. Uh, signs that say to the front entrance to get people back to, uh, to, to the starting point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have somebody leaving our meeting and, and getting lost and wandering about, about for this amount of time... Uh, you know, I'm sure that there's humor written in it right now, but I'm sure it was kind of frustrating for the poor woman who was trying to uh, get out of out of here after visiting us. And it, in in retrospect, in terms of looking at the way the building's set up, I think that uh, it would do us well to make invest in some signage that will get people out of the building as well as to where they want to be coming in. Y yes, uh, that's. <laughs> Good suggestion. Yeah. Good suggestion. I just did want to note that <laughs> not helpful to this person at all because she had a stroller, but 
the exits and levels in the stairways are marked, which in the case of an emergency, that's the way our students would be expected to leave the building. Well, it so, doesn't tell you that third floor level is the way out. No, no, the elevator doesn't. Well, because no, the, the stairways really don't, too. The, the stairways do have, a, do have exit markings. Um, which do have, uh, is required by fire code. Right. And, well, and we do. Access, but some of those exits right. go, uh, don't go right. where the people want to go. Right. right. So I, I just wanted to point out that there's no imminent danger for the students coming here that they will not be able to get mm -hmm. out of the building. Should but but to, to that point, I think it's a, it's a good one, and we're going to be in this building for a while, and people should be able to find their way. It is a, it is a labyrinth, and I think that, that is feedback that mm -hmm. I've heard on the numerous tours that we have given in the last, um, since December, we, mm. we had a tour on March 15th, mm -hmm. and we had close to 100 people come on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, our, our afternoon ones were not as, there were like mm -hmm. 20 would come, but still, there was a, a lot, lot of people mm -hmm. that coming. And I know that a number of people have said we should do more of these, and we will. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, we certainly will do another Saturday sometime this spring, mm -hmm. and then this will be ongoing because I think people need to be able to to, mm -hmm. to see the building uh, firsthand. Um, and and these tours take a while too; mm -hmm. they take a good hour and a half. And even mm -hmm. then, I took a tour of a group of people mm -hmm. one evening, and um, <laughs> it was funny. I would we'd go into a room and I'd see them sitting down. <laughs> I keep we keep going, but we didn't finish the tour. We just, it just, it takes, a, it takes a while to just even walk the building. Mm -hmm. um, so um, actually we're talking about goals this evening, sort of mid-year um, sort of checkups of where we are. And, and this was actually one of our district goals that we had. And I, and I, would, I would say that um, mm -hmm. we are moving, we've moved quite well on this. And to actually feel very good about the, the statement of interest. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what other districts are, mm -hmm. are there. And I think that in general, and this is very general, they, they take a high school one a year, maybe two, just depending about the amount of money that they, that they have. And uh, so mm -hmm. we'll see, cross our fingers. But speaking of schools and, and the work that we're, that's going on, we are also working on Stratton as well. We have a building committee and, and Cindy's on that committee. And I don't know if you even want to chime in here, please do, because we have met um, a couple of times, and um, I think that we are moving much closer to a definition of what would be parity with the other elementary schools, because that's the kind of clarity you sort of have to have in terms of what we think needs to, needs to be remodeled there or changed or what, we, what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. We have found out that we can um, do an RFP to get an architect to help us at this point. The, the only disadvantage of doing it the way we're doing it right now is that we're going to have to do this twice mm -hmm. in, in terms of how they do bid laws on, on this kind of work. But we, we just felt that we would rather do that than go do the whole process right now, which would take us closer to the summer before we're ready to involve an architect. So I think that... Um, Probably by May, we should have someone that's going to be able to work with the committee and taking some of the ideas to paper because that's what that's what we need to be able to do for the capital committee is to be able to give them an idea, uh, a very solid idea of what what needs to be done and what the the cost would be. Mm -hmm. How are we funding this architect? How are we funding the architect? Um, we're working with the town manager on that. Thank you. Um, so that, that's moving, moving forward. And I think the people in town will be reassured to know that we have, in this, in this um, effort to move forward with the high school, we have not forgotten um, the Stratton Elementary. And so what will be presented to the capital committee in the fall is a plan, sort of a cost, a cost, and then we'll have to figure out, you know, how we're going to move forward. One part of it may be that we will do a, um, a, a statement of interest for major repair to the state to the MSBA for some of the costs, and 
and we'll be looking at other ways that we can fund the rest of it. All right. Um, I want to congratulate the, uh, the school committee on their performance on Sunday at the Trivia B. <laughs> we, uh, they were also strong contenders for the best costume. That 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 hat, that hat was uh, nice fine. Yeah, it was it was very good. Though we did keep hearing quack quack. <laughs> <laughs> it was distracting you from your from your answers, but it was good. It was like other other yes tables. It was okay. other tables. Oh, yeah. I see. That was the point to do it. We almost had that tennis ball just up there. Just, we almost, we almost yeah, had that height. And then height all of a sudden. And the measurement challenge. Yeah. The measurement challenge. Design so those are very clever challenges. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're very clever. Yeah. And um, the, the AEA had a, they did well. They did very well in great costumes. It was, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, I, I, I was really impressed with some of the students. They were, when they would have these design challenges, the adults would be, trying to figure out where to start. And they are already like, they did one and they didn't like it or they fell down and they would do it again. They were just, they were just <laughs> there with the, with the whole experience very well. Um, we are uh, moving forward with the search for Thompson principal. Um, some interviews have begun. I, last night I met, I met with the staff and then last night I met with parents uh, to hear their thoughts about the search and also the qualities they're looking for for a, a new principal, uh, the hope would be is that we might we might be able to be at a decision point um, before vacation. But we'll have to wait and see where we are on that. And we will be, as we've done with other searches, have an, uh, opportunities for um, mm -hmm. to, for the candidate to come spend spend a good portion of the day here and also meet with administrators, teachers, and hopefully, you know, you, you'd be most welcome to attend the community part of it. All right, so I'll let you know when that happens. Mm -hmm. So I think that basically covers the, uh, the, um, the major issues right now, and I wanna thank the Otteson Middle School and all for their, for their performance tonight. Um, but as we get into the spring, as you know, we get into high levels of concerts, and the high school will be doing Footloose actually before we meet again. So that's next that's right. weekend. It yeah. will be on the first weekend in April. Fourth so it's the, the fourth and fifth. Yes, it's election, right. day. election day. Election, election day. Election day. Yeah. Be a busy day. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank God. Right. Oh, Dr. Dr. Allison. Did you want yes, to? you wanted a uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I was thinking about doing it, but they're right, I, well, I, we did say doing it during this report. This morning, um, both uh, Dr. Alice Nampi and I attended the EDCO Legislative Forum, and it was a panel of superintendents as well as Glenn Kucher mm -hmm. talking about what are, what are some of the unfunded mandates that mm -hmm. school districts are facing, and just r r really there's, there was a, um, a lot of information that was there, and we have a, at your places, I think, Karen, you put that, it's a list of the unfunded and underfunded mandates that school districts have that they, they need to address. Now, this, this does not even cover the list of 180, I think it's about 180, checklists that the superintendents have to file in the way of reports every year to the Department of Education. But I think that what this particular document gives you a very good um, idea is just the, the, the level of reports and initiatives, mandates that, that all the school districts need to comply with. And so I, I don't think that there was any solutions that came out of this other than um, there was <coughs> you know, suggestions, the, the, some of our state legislators were there, especially um, um, Representative Paish, who, is, who, is, who chairs the Joint Committee for the House and the Senate on Education. And, and just thinking about how we deal with some of these issues that are facing all districts. And it, it was an informative, um, an informative morning. I, 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 don't, I don't think we have a roadmap yet in terms of all the things that we uh, need to do, except that they were certainly suggesting that we 
talk to our, our representatives, making sure they understand exactly what concerns we have. And uh, I, I think given the breadth of these, you, want, you sort of want to zero in on certain things that have, would be particularly helpful. Um, Dr. <laughs> Sorry. Dr. Bodie went over the high points of it. I attended partly as kind of a dry run for our next session to get so we can be more focused when we go in on the uh, MASC Day on the Hill. Um, but it was interesting hearing the discussion. But the thing that I thought was the most helpful was I was able to network with the person who was sitting next to me who is a school committee member from Lexington. And she and I have decided that we're going to go meet with Representative Kaufman. Um, mm -hmm. Our feeling is the pie needs to be bigger. It, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's enough to talk about how we slice up the pie, but we think the pie needs to be bigger. Mm -hmm. And we feel like it's great to say talk to your representatives and get them to support, but we feel our representatives mm -hmm. are already, most of the EDCO representatives are already pretty much mm -hmm. in line with this. Mm -hmm. So we're not accomplishing much by that. And so we're wondering if perhaps Representative Kaufman or you know, who knows where he'll send us, but just to get an idea of what can we do to help make the pie bigger, um, given that we think a lot of the not as in favor of it is living elsewhere. And so I'll see where that goes and report back. Mr. Henry. I, I would ask us also to consider something else. Um, and this may be because I may show my age suggesting civil disobedience, mm -hmm. but the, even if we had all the money to deal with this, we don't, we and I, especially our staff, do not have the time to do a lot of it. And so I agree with what you're, you're suggesting, but also throw into the mix the realization, and I think I just said it very eloquently tonight, take a breath, step back, and let us get what you've asked for done first. It, it's interesting you bring that up because someone asked exactly that question, including the phrase mm -hmm. civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. And there was some feeling that from the superintendent from Brookline, um, Mr. Lupini, that there is this fair amount of dragging of heels and doing things as slowly as possible it, along those ends that, that he does feel just there's too much. And I, th I think if all the school districts said no, there's no way they could nail us all. I'm not suggesting it, but I mean, there's some point where we, I cannot imagine, I felt overburdened when I was a teacher 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine the teachers today with all that we're asking them to do. Uh, and, and the administrators, all the reports and everything else that are coming down to support this. It's, it's just not, some, something's got to give somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it does occupy a lot of our time, and I think the challenge is every day to try to keep things in perspective in terms of a triage of importance. The, inf the thing about is some of these is though that you have to, you do have to be compliant. Um, and so there's issues of at what level you do it at. And so when Dr. Lopini was talking about that, you know, doing what you need to do to, to, to uh, dot your I's, cross your T's, but at the same time, try to keep that sense of balance and perspective, which can be challenging. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot that, uh, that faces us all, all the time. And, <clears throat> and you know, as, as um, Dr. Sheston has been experiencing just even this park, this new mandate, just the field test has just absolutely absorbed mm -hmm. your time recently, and not just yours, but mm -hmm. several people's, in order to be able just to get us mm -hmm. ready in terms of the technology, the training, the PD, and um, it is quite significant. And I think that's the challenge in general about what in this world of ma mandates, and I just said it once, but it just really, is something I do think about a lot in terms of just the priorities of how, how you organize your day. And sometimes you can, things can just get away. It's just, and and that, that's going to happen anyway because crises happen, problems happen all the time. But um, I think trying to always sort of step back and think about what's really important that I need to keep my eye on mm -hmm. 
and yeah, things, definitely things need to get done, but what's the important part? And actually, that actually goes to one of my goals this year, which is being out in the schools, specifically was being out at least three times um, to be able to be in classrooms, talking with the principals about what's going on in the school in terms of um, teaching and learning. And when I've been able to, and, and, I, and I think by just setting that goal for myself, it has helped um, prioritize some of the weeks Putting, putting these time, when I see a block, put it, you know, just put in no meetings in my calendar so I can get to a particular school. And I think that next year I, I'll refine the process because I've learned a little bit more this year in terms of how to do it. And there's other things I want to see besides just being in the classrooms too. Um, I want to be, you know, see faculty meetings and, and I've been to, I've actually been to some schools several times, more than I anticipated, you know, even sitting in on some SST meetings to see how they're running. And I, I wanting to expand the repertoire of the things that I see. But what I can report out is that, first of all, it has helped me to do that step back and what is really important. And I think being out there more this year than I was last year, because you can, it's, it's easy to let all this stuff and email and meetings and you know to um, control the day versus trying to control it in another way. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not perfect, but I also uh, think that it has you know it's been helpful having the conversations. And I think in general, when I reflect about just the whole process of goal setting, when you write something down and you sort of try to schedule it. it. It really is, it's a different, it's different than saying, oh, this year I'm going to be in schools more. It's just, it's very different to have a set schedule. And I think that from talking with, even children do this. In fact, I was, I was telling a couple of people, we had a principal's meeting after school yesterday and one of our principals came in and, and, and one of the kindergartners was talking about wanting to report what their learning goal was this week. And they write the learning goals down, and then they assess at the end of the week how they've done with their learning goals. And so this kind of practice of doing that kind of thinking is really, um, uh, I think, a, a very positive thing. So, in fact, I was, we, we, we do um, uh, book reads at town for the town departments. We've had a number of books we've read together this year. And one of the books talked about uh, this idea of writing goals down, that the, 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 the act of writing a goal down and sort of being able to refer back to it is a ver very powerful organizational management tool. Mm -hmm. And I think that the fact that the teachers do this, and we're now having our students do this, probably should do more of that and even the upper grades, I think is, is helpful. And so, what I would say about where I am at this point, I would say that uh, I think it was a well-chosen goal. I think it has helped me have the ability with all of these forces that are out there to keep a little bit better focus on the importance. And um, <clears throat> I'll certainly report more about that as we go on this year, but I think it's been very helpful in my practice. But also we're talking about goals because uh, uh, in my role, it's also not only about the personal goals I put down, but where are we in terms of the district goals? Mm -hmm. and, um, and and we could talk a little bit about this. Actually, as we've gone through this year, one of the district goals had to talk, we did about talk about um, district determined measures. And I think you're gonna see over these next weeks what where we are in that process. Um, I think that determining what these measures are is a challenge when in, in a lot of areas, but um, in physical education, for example, or in art, so we, we think of uh, measures sometimes as assessments. And, um, and so it's, it, I think it's been an interesting process for other people to go through too. And, and, but I, I would have to say that as we move forward, next year we have to identify what they're going to be for every um, 
area of this every discipline in the in the uh, school district but I think it's gonna be something that's gonna evolve and I think the important part of it isn't so much the actual product though I think that that's important um, but it's the thinking about it in terms of what it is that you really feel is important that in your discipline or as you as an educator you accomplish mm -hmm. and helping students accomplish so I think it's if you can step back and look at it that way, rather than just here it is, another one of those mandates, but see what, mm -hmm. what is the, the gold in, the, in there, that's, I think that's helpful. Some of these, certainly with respect to achievement, we're gonna have to wait, uh, you know, and really till next year uh, to see what the success of it is. What, what is the measure of whether we have aligned, fully aligned the curriculum? Well, we, we, you know, we have documents, of course, that and that indicate that but one of the external measures of that of course is how the students do because the, this this year the MCAS is fully aligned with the, um, the the common core state standards um, so what we've been able to do we've um, we've been able to provide professional development to implement the new system and improve um, instructional practice um, we had this is a, this is something that's going to be evolving we certainly know last year we did a, a, a quite a bit of professional development about the new educator evaluation system I would say that this year it's the, the professional developments in the practice of it and what we're learning about it and you already received one survey that we had back in the winter time um, about how teachers were feeling about the, the professional, professional development and, and we'll certainly do a follow-up with that at the end of the year as well. I think you're planning think, another... Mm -hmm. In uh, June. In June. Okay. As far as the teachers who are... The, another one of our goal under staff excellence and professional development had to do with retail. Mm -hmm. And we've had 30 teachers in the fall take retail and we now have another 30 teachers um, that are going to be taking, that are currently taking the retail course. Mm -hmm. We, as administrators, are also planning to take the administrators retail this summer, provided that the state's ready to give us the course. But we have already set time aside for that, and so if it doesn't happen this summer, we'll be doing it um, the following year. And then, with respect to kindergarten teachers, uh, we can talk more about this, actually. Uh, we're gonna talk about the, the, an update on the tools program, but we'll be doing that on, we've scheduled for April 10th agenda. But there has been multi prongs of professional development uh, for the tools of the mind. Um, the technology plan, you've heard quite a bit about that this year, and uh, that's been sort of an ongoing discussion. I, I think at this point, it's pretty clear that we have been moving forward, and I give a lot of credit to, to Laura for um, a lot of the work that has been done. With respect to maintenance delivery, uh, uh, the maintenance service delivery, that, that is in progress. Um, the, the town, there's a town-wide committee that's working on developing a multi a way to develop a multi-year plan of maintenance. But one thing I can say that has, that is significantly different at this point is that by, by hiring a day manager and a night, a new night manager this year, we have seen a big difference in the cleanliness of this building. Um, it's a challenge, just because we've talked about how big this building is, but it's also been a challenge because We've had a number of custodians who have been out in, uh, on disabilities or um, uh, for, um, and we don't ever, ever have a full complement of people here. So the people that are working are working very hard and doing a good job. But I would say that across the district, we're seeing an improvement in our maintenance. And I, I give a lot of credit to the two people we've hired that they they have a very high very high expectations and they also have checklists that they're they're checking to see how things are going not only with our own custodians who work
but also the outside groups that we have hired, both here at the high school and also at the middle school. Could I just yep. quickly ask a question? Are these people working for us, or are they part of the custodians that are under the town? Well, it's a complicated arrangement. Well, we, we, they're on our payroll, and but they are um, town employees rather than school school department. Mm -hmm. There's they're supervised by the town. They're in the D, they're Thank part you. of DPW. Thank you. But we, and I, even though there's that that difference, we work very closely together. I, I wouldn't. I just. I'm not as that, that guess, line my question, isn't as. My question was: Have things changed with regard to that? The answer is no. The answer is no. Thank you. I don't think it's. I don't know if it's going to change, in that regard. I had hopes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about Why that? Didn't make a change? Which one? This one right here. Oh, that's the, the last one for that oh. section. Um, well, this the programs developed by the special education department. We, I'd like to wait on that and talk a little bit more about that particular one another evening because I'd like to have Kathleen Lockyer come in, mm -hmm. and she's already been in once. But I, I think having her on the agenda this spring would be very a very good thing to hear about the the programs, mm -hmm. the kind of um, ways we're using data, just just as an update in general about special education. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we've talked earlier this fall about uh, the diversity of the Arlington Public School staff, and actually, this might be a good point to mention the meeting that you had, because Rob has been very involved in this, and we hosted uh, a, a meeting here just uh, yesterday. Just yesterday. Just yesterday. No, sorry. We, um, so I'm, we are, Arlington is a member of the MPDE, the Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity in Education, which is um, currently about 18 school districts um, that have, that this has been a long-standing organization who have a common goal of increasing diversity among educators in Massachusetts. And we usually meet in, actually in Randolph, which is one of the member communities, but um, this month we were asked to host it here in Arlington. We actually met in this room just yesterday morning. And uh, so, I mean, this includes, uh, uh, Members from Randolph and Sharon, Andover, Somerville, um, goes far west as Pittsfield, um, and someone from Pittsfield was on the phone actually, um, just listening in, um, and several other communities. And uh, Steve Pereira, the former METCO director, was very involved in this organization, has been very involved in th this organization, and is still the president of the organization. So he was here yesterday. And Regina Keynes, who's a member of the Superintendent's Diversity Advisory Committee, is the professional consultant to this organization and so and is an Arlington resident so um, she asked that we host it here and it was our pleasure to do so All right. the, this this is the organization that is hosting the uh, diversity job fair uh, and we are hosting it again here this year we plan to have as we have in the past a coffee inviting prospective candidates to come and meet with principals and department chairs where there are openings and the the the, the diversity commit my my diversity diversity advisory committee are fabulous they will they do a lot of work and they'll they'll call people up to remind them to come to this and i know a number of you have attended which has been terrific it's going to be may 14th this year yeah and the job fairs it's wednesday april 30th um in the afternoon after school um, between three and six um, and uh, we will invite there will be some advertisements uh, by the organization on some local radio and uh, and the Boston Globe or Boston.com there'll be some different advertisements to uh, advertise the job fair so the coffee's May mm -hmm. 14th, you the coffee's May 14th. Okay, yeah. thanks. so what are the results of all these efforts? Because we've certainly been working at it. it. It hasn't been as positive as we would have liked. We gave you that report back in the fall. But we also know that, th that these other communities are saying the same issue. They have the same issue. And also that Boston this year is going to be hiring, they're, they're intent on hiring 1,000 teachers. And we're concerned that we're going to be in competition with um, that hiring effort. Right. I think Boston is focusing a lot of their recruiting efforts on increasing their diversity. I think they are under a sort of a court order to do so. Um, that's my understanding. Um, that's still in effect. And so um, they really um, are being very aggressive in uh, uh, 
in advertising and uh, recruiting. Um, we're doing, we're being, we're recruiting, we're attending job fairs. We are um, trying to get good candidates in when we have openings and really uh, use different tools that we have through School Spring and other uh, sources to identify um, candidates of color who, may, who are qualified for positions and bring them in to interview. So we're trying to, we're doing a lot. Right. So next fall, you'll, you'll know what the fruits of our labor will be. Um, the other, there were, four, there were four action plans under the operations, communications, um, and, and, and stakeholder engagement goal. Um, and, and the third one was the Stratton, which we talked about. And then also the fourth one was the projection model for long-range multi-year planning, and that you saw back in the fall um, the doc, uh, that uh, Diane Johnson had created. So we're moving, we're moving ahead pretty well with, with these goals, and we, we'll have some more follow-ups and maybe a summary in, in June. Great. Any questions on the mid-year school committee members? Okay. Great. Moving on to... Can I mention one more thing? Yeah, please. Goals. Part of our agreement with the um, AEA is that we will have our district goals for next year ready in May and June. Mm -hmm. And it's also school improvement goals. We've already begun the discussion with administrators, and this is something that we need to spend some time on. So I, I'm thinking that we, we might want to schedule a retreat at some point. You and I, mm -hmm. Kathy and I have already talked about it. And we have to get a date. Again, waiting for the fifth. But uh, once that's gone, I, I think it, you might even want to start it ahead of time. It's start set a out a doodle mm -hmm. for availability after, for Saturday. After the election, we can well, yeah. wait, wait till after the election. Whatever. But we'll do one. What is the deadline, May? May? Well, in our last game, it was for May 15th, but we realized that that would be very hard to, to do. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't, but on the other hand, how do, the, how do schools do their improvement plans? Mm -hmm. So I think there's some simplicity that needs to occur in this. It really, it's a, we were, we were talking about it more philosophically, which we can spend some time on at the retreat, in terms like, you know, these are like very specific kinds of things that we need to do, and they don't really relate as much to what teachers need to do, the Stratton plan or SOIs. That's not really the direction they're looking for. What they want to know is, as a district, you know, what are the things that we really want to be emphasizing around teaching and learning? Because that's what they want to know. Should I be spending more time in working on math? Uh, or are we going to really have a literacy focus or writing focus next year? And that's, I think, is really what the intent of getting a sense of where we're going mm -hmm. um, in terms of emphasis next year. Okay. And so that's what we need to be talking about. It doesn't mean that we can't have other th Things, but that's not as important to have ready by June, really. Okay. Okay. Cool. Dr. Allison. So we could. So I understand that this, the dates were set by contract and mm -hmm. stuff, and I understand rolling it back and the mm -hmm. problems with everyone having to rely on pieces. But I feel like some of our best goals have been informed by student achievement results. And we're going to have to just we don't have so I'm just is there yeah. anything that we have to work with or are we just looking at last year's MCAS and could, could mm -hmm. feeling where the wind is going just a suggestion that part of I think that's an important thing to bring to the table but I would suggest that possibly the superintendent the assistant superintendent offer some of these things that we might consider mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to be able to wait for MCAS scores in the fall before we can do it and you, you understand that but possibly offer us some suggestions, and it, it, if we, we right. grab that's that's my question. Is, right, is there anything that we can get? I think we we will. Go ahead. Okay. Definitely. Because in other words, if to try to grasp your point, if we're relying on previous year's MCAS scores, we're always operating a year behind in our district yeah. goal setting. Mm -hmm. Right. Than, than the current year that we're right. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, right. No, this was, seems like it's outdated. This was you, you saw concern. some data even tonight that you could yes. consider the the benchmark data for DRA. Mm -hmm. That's just one piece, a little piece of data, but there's other data from writing that we could bring those things forward to you. The dialogue when we initially started talking about doing the district determined measures and stuff, what I heard from Ms. Hanson was that they didn't want that to be being used for goal setting mm -hmm. and stuff. 
So it, this was, that's, that's mm. what I heard. That's what you heard. Um, now, that was, may have been just her opinion or you know, it may have been his firm, I don't know. But I'm just saying, I like data when I'm making mm -hmm. decisions mm -hmm. and setting goals. And I just, I don't see right. any data out here to look at. And mm -hmm. I can come up with stuff, I mean, ideas of. So maybe that's something that we can bring to the retreat is yeah. some actual. Yes, some well, data. Uh, for discussion sure. points. We need it enough. before mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. We can talk yeah. about that. But I think we need it beforehand. So I yes. think what yeah. saying, which I endorse is that as you start to formulate the mm -hmm. goal, because you're thinking about the goals now. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, so you're doing mm -hmm. this work right now. You've got to come to the retreat probably with a draft. Yeah. Presumably. And so I think that I think Kirsty makes a good point. The data needs to mm -hmm. drive the setting of the goals. And it's and even if it's Dave, it's last year's data, it's last year's data, but it helps drive the setting. But of the we goals. need to have it ahead of time. Yes, the data that was used to inform the budget mm -hmm. decisions for next year is already Some. somewhat aligned with the goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so just, it seems like having that data on hand where it already exists and it's already made our budgeting decisions for next year yeah. should be the starting point. But it's not going to be my headache, it's going to be your headache. <laughs> oh, thanks. No, you can still go to the retreat. <laughs> yeah. public meeting. We'll give you one of those roll-up sandwiches, too. All right, thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 14134, dated March 13, 2014, in the amount of $307,206.73. Approval of draft minutes, special school committee meeting on February 14, 2014. Mm -hmm. the regular school, meeting, uh, school committee meeting on February 27, 2014. Special School Committee meeting on March 6, 2014, and approval of the Arlington High School UPenn uh, Model Congress trip that they just started on today, as a matter of fact, March 2014. Ms. Hyde? Um, I ask that we pull Special School Committee meeting February 14th. Okay. Um, the two of us can't vote on that. Anyone else? Okay. Um, All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Now, um, move, so, uh, move approval of the minutes to the special school committee meeting of February 14th, 2014. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstain? Abstention. Oh, abstention. Okay. Mm -hmm. Five, zero, two. Um, great. Subcommittee liaison reports, policy and procedures, Mr. Thielman. Okay, so I handed, I, you have in your packets a document mm -hmm. uh, which summarizes all the changes. I'm, I'll go through them briefly. These are, and this summarizes the best of my memory, what we, the subcommittee talked about with Attorney Bryant and mm -hmm. Kiersey and Paul can mm -hmm. add in. Uh, so the first three policies, Essentially, we have one policy in the in the district in the our policy handbook right now, AC slash ACA, and Rebecca Bryant, the or the attorney from Stoneman Chandler and Miller, said that uh, the best practice is to have three separate policies: a, a, a non-discrimination statement with updated language that um, is consistent with requirements of the Office of Civil Rights of the U.S. Department of Education, a separate policy on harassment. Um, and then procedures for addressing complaints. So that's why AC slash ACA is broken out into three policies, AC, ACA, and ACA slash, uh, I mean, ACA dash R. That's the first one. Quick question on, do you, is there um, a reason to put the phone numbers and the addresses? Yes, she said that, um, that's what the um, Office of Civil Rights wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to publish, you're supposed to make it known to the public and what, what the addresses are. And then she asked, which I think is in there, she asked that we put a, a statement in there, updated contact information above, last updated in March of 2014. So you, we're gonna want some sort of calendar to mm -hmm. keep this pretty regular, right? To right. keep the current numbers and addresses. 
What you said is it can just be an administrative change. Okay. Yeah, administrative um, Mr. Change. Fitzgerald we don't need can just yeah. fix okay. them. We don't need to do it. So but as, as a matter of course, the school system is going to update it, uh, check it and update it do, before the first day of school. Do we have that currently going on in our policies where we have like numbers and addresses uh, right now? I think it's the only time I've ever seen a, a phone number <clears throat> addresses in a policy, but she said this is the, okay. yeah. the best practice. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that we're going to have to check every year okay. and make sure yeah. it's... Yeah. I mean, they don't today. move that often. Right. The, no. The, these offices, yeah. these federal and state offices don't really pick up and move. I think they sometimes they, give a do. nice little thing that you can put on well, bulletin boards. So, some of the agencies that I've seen do Miller. pretty, like, every five years. Oh, do they when the leases? Okay, well, there you go. So, <laughs> well, um, okay, so the, that's the first three. And the next one is policy KAA. Um, and so... The first thing that this does is it codifies the current practice of having correspondence sent to the administrative secretary and then forwarded to the chair and all school committee members. Um, it adds a requirement, which Rebecca pointed out is, is done in a lot of school districts in the state, that the administrative secretary attach a list of correspondence to the agenda. It codifies the current practice. Um, to the agenda? Yes. Well, we don't often have it all by the time of the agenda. Well, we don't have to. You'd roll it over to the next whatever agenda. Whatever you got. You whatever you don't have. Like no, we attach it to the minutes. I think it should be attached to the minutes, not the agenda. Well, no, it's attached to the agenda to serve notice for people who want to look to see what the correspondence is. So you, what you would do, I think what We don't necessarily know by well, the time the agenda goes out. What We well, often get agenda, correspondence what, what, between the time the agenda goes out and the minutes. We attach it. To our minutes. So what, what you what I, think, I would change it to read that. Well, should be it, this may change because if if we do go electronically, when Karen presses the button, everyone will get it electronically well, at the same time. So I think what what we would do. But it should be attached to the minutes, not the you agenda. Would, you would both. I think what you would do is just hmm. what a lot of school committees do is they just say correspondence received from X date to X date. Mm -hmm. So let's say mm -hmm. from. Um, I don't know, the, the, the Tuesday before the last meeting from, to the Tuesday before this meeting. So it's just over a two-week period, this is the correspondence received. So I don't, I don't think it's that complicated. And yeah. our thinking on this is that this, by attaching it to the agenda, mm -hmm. that that would eliminate the need to read all of it down. Yes. At, at, mm -hmm. at a meeting. So we'd save five minutes per mm -hmm. meeting or more. So I think you just, you just I said. Don't, I don't care if you read it or not. Mm -hmm. I still think it should be attached to the minutes and not the agenda. Mm -hmm. But the, I just suggest that at the end of the meeting, it, 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 even if it requires a quick vote, it goes. It has to go on the minutes as well, yeah, okay. because it's part of the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you, but by putting, I think it should be on both. I think it, there's no, there's nothing in the policy prohibiting it from being mm -hmm. on both. Mm -hmm. It can be on both. Ms. Hart? Um, it it just seems to me that the same way we don't know who's going to arrive for public participation mm -hmm. and while we do take that and we add it to our minutes mm -hmm. we have no way of knowing what correspondence we're going to receive mm -hmm. and so what you're talking about is whether it becomes some sort of for notification for a meeting or whether it just becomes an open document as to what everybody has been <coughs> privy to and so in essence if we attach it to the minutes, it almost seems like we're inviting these as topics for discussion or public input at the public participation piece of our meeting, as opposed to just information that the committee members receive. So if I were here when this was going to be voted, yeah, I would I mean, go for, I would go for Ms. Stark's recommendation of added, added I mean, unless minutes. we're gonna take it up, like the Board of Selectmen has their list of mm -hmm. Um, I've noticed at the bottom of their agendas, receipt. but it's core, it's usually that 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 stuff that they're going to talk about. Right. Right. No. No. Mr. Well, when we sit here in the meeting and listen to the recitation of all the correspondence that has come the way of the committee, I mean that list exists at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So if that list exists at that point of time, and we've gotten all the correspondence in the packet as we assemble the packet. As that correspondence goes into the packet, we list the correspondence that was received and included so that it is 
published at the, at, the, at the time of the final agenda on the day of the meeting or at the time the packet goes out. And if we send additional correspondence out, that document could be updated, updated electronically. The point is, is that we're sitting here reading a list of correspondence, and some of it is, uh, is old. I mean, we, we, we read invitations to events that happened a week or two before the school committee meeting. Uh, and some of it is just perfunctory, but we're reading this entire list. Rather than sit here and listen to the entire list, all we're saying is take that list and not read it, just attach it to the agenda. And if we want it attached to the minutes, fine, that's not but a I problem. Think, why is reading it tied to where it's attached to? Well, what, what we're trying to do is not sit here and read it yes, for Yes, but five you don't minutes. have to read it. You can not read it. Well, no, no. The thing is, is that uh, <laughs> no, so, I don't understand yeah. what that has we're, to we're do with attaching so it. We're to the agenda. This is our way of acknowledging the correspondence within the meeting, so that we're not reading it aloud, but it is in the document for the meeting. So, okay. So, so I don't. It's, I don't think this is a substantial change. It's what what this really is 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 uh, you, the, when the agenda goes out two days before the meeting, uh, you would put on it an attachment that says all correspondence received from X date to X date, mm -hmm. and, and you would have a summary of it, which mm -hmm. this, this, and so the, mm -hmm. the purpose of this, Rebecca's theory bond is actually, it's more transparent. Mm -hmm. So the public knows that the correspondence received over the past two weeks was received by the school committee. It's attached to the agenda in a document. Mm -hmm. Anybody, the, the, the 50 or 60 people that you send the agenda out to, including the media, see uh, all the people that have corresponded with the school committee in a document, and the public knows about it. It's from a date certain to a date certain. Mm -hmm. It would probably have to be two days before the meeting, two days before the, mm -hmm. the previous meeting to two days before the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I think for her, her perspective, it's a modern, modernizing our committee, mm -hmm. and it's a transparency. Mm -hmm. well, it, well, I mean, people, and it's, that's it, correspondence received. <laughs> if I didn't get it, I didn't get it. So, all right, so um, that's the... The modernization of that practice. Uh, okay, so in IJJ, it adds a reference to electronic instructional materials. Um, it deletes the establishment of the review committee by the principal because that's not our current practice, and textbook selection is by the district. It's centralized. Uh, and the considerations section is updated to, con to, to include more current uh, non discrimination language. And then IJK just refers to policy IJJ. IJL deletes the phrase curriculum approved by the school committee and adds subsequent to review by the superintendent and the budgetary parameters of the school committee. So we don't, we don't necessarily approve the curriculum. We approve a budget um, that, uh, uh, that allows the curriculum to be delivered. Um, she adds a catch-all phrase, library media staff specialists are urged to consult reputable, unbiased, professional, prepared uh, selection aides and adhere to the following goals. Um, there, she adds a statement in there about uh, the receipt of library books as gifts. Uh, and she clarifies that the policy is rooted in the United States Constitution. So that's um, IJL, which is uh, the policy on library media materials. And then IJM just changes the policy to be selection and adoption of materials offered by special interest groups. Um, and it, and, it, and it, clarify, it, it codifies current practice, which is faculty or staff members may use such materials only with the approval of the principal or department head. So that's, those are all the changes. On first reads going forward, I would just love to get back to the redlining. I don't like the one packet is the new and one packet is the old. It's just much easier for me to see the changes on one. I know. I, I have to, well, you got to differentiate um, instruction with attorneys sometimes, too, you know. They, so they, I mean. <laughs> oh, attorneys. Well, I mean, I, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. I actually prefer that myself, but we didn't. We can do that. I think okay. the next committee that sits. I, and I, I think that when they sit down. By, by the way, I do want to. You know, I have to say, Rebecca has been ter terrific to work yeah, with, and it's great. been actually the best um, uh, we've done in terms of reviewing policies because you have a professional in the room who who has a global view of lots of districts, and she gives a lot of good advice. Good. I think you're right, Judd. 
it's much easier to get a red line version. Mm -hmm. okay. I prefer it too. No, anyone? We'll, we'll have to probably make a list too of the ones that you're, they're going to be eliminated, so that that'll have to be voted too at the same time. Well, that's what we're doing. We're, yeah, it's yeah. a sub subbing, but I think there's some that were totally eliminated too. Mm -hmm. We've done that. You did yeah, that the last time. That the last, last time. time. It was so just it was eliminated. We've eliminated yeah. five, but several. So anyway, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Good job. Well, Do you guys have a next meeting set up? No, no. There's We've no been, uh, reorging for us. We've met nine times this year. Mm -hmm. We're done. <laughs> I, I, I personally, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to, to have that committee allow me to attend, and I, I, I commend them for all the work they've done. It, 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 you've done a, so, a phenomenal job, and, and with all my issues with lawyers and that money we spent, I think that's the best bucks we've spent so far. She was excellent. No, she was uh, really. Mm -hmm. The firm's been excellent in helping us with the policies. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, great. For second read on April 10th, yeah, budget. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, I didn't know if anyone else uh, saw this. This was in the Globe on March 20th. Uh, Newton is also having a soaring budget due to increased, increased students. Um, so I'm always looking for other districts that are uh, they are um, looking already at 61 new mm -hmm. elementary students. Um, I don't know, it was just interesting. Uh, they had, I felt like they actually had fewer students, but somehow they got more money. Um, but anyway, I thought, I just thought it was interesting. Um, I wanted to say that, I put a plug in for there is a last blast fundraiser at the Monotomy Tavern on Monday uh, from 7 to 9. So for those of you who um, will eventually have high schoolers. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's from 7 to 9, and it's just so that they can raise money to help pay for the last blast, which is an awesome party, all-night party that all the kids get to go to. Um, we don't have another budget meeting planned because I wasn't sure who's going to be budget chair, so we haven't done anything. But once once we know that for sure, we will um, we will move on. And I wanted to take this opportunity, Judson, um, while I was thinking of my three adjectives. <laughs> my friend Liba, I also thought of three for you, knowing that this is your last meeting uh, as chair. Fortunately, at least you will be joining back here in the ranks of the plebes on the other side of the <laughs> chair there. Um, but I wanted to, uh, I, I chose three adjectives for you as well, and here they are. My first is loyal. You are one of the most loyal people I know, not only to our committee, but to friends, family, and of course, your Boston teams. <laughs> you are behind those you believe in 100%, and we all know that we can always count on you. The second adjective I chose for you is contem contemplative. While you always have an opinion and have no fear of taking a stand, you are also willing to listen to all sides and consider all of the information that we have before us before you come to a final decision. And I think that's been really great as chair. I think that that's a really wonderful quality. And the third one I have for you is calm. <laughs> no matter what happens, I have never seen you fly off the handle. I have never even seen you get remotely flustered. And I know that that may be go different things may be going on inside, um, but you have the ability to project calm, and I believe that this is an amazing asset in a chair. And I really want to thank you for having that ability. I feel like you have brought that to us and kind of helped drive us in those directions. I just I would just want to thank you for everything you've done this past year. I feel like you've really given us some great guidance, and your leadership has been really wonderful. It's been awesome to sit here and and been an honor to serve under you as chair, and, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on the committee. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. And I have nothing else as far as budget goes. Not as eloquent as my compatriot here, but I have tested those calmness several times <laughs> privately. I almost got to see the fluster, but he had the control, and I admire it. He's calmed me several times. Thank you. I didn't get a chance to say it, but I want to say thank you very much. Great job as chair. Yeah, thank really, you. Very well, well, well done. Thank well you organized, mm -hmm. even-handed. Mm -hmm. I always felt that it was fair and mm -hmm. got all information out to everybody in the committee mm -hmm. in an equal way. So mm -hmm. great job. In two weeks, we'll get back at you. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> what to get back at? What did he do? <laughs> You'll see. You'll see. I have a trophy for him, too. Oh, oh goodness. There's unresolved issues between the chair and the vice chair. But mm-hmm. It's a fun relationship, chair <laughs> vice chair. It's really. Yeah, but look, they yet. finally organized their ties. Yeah. Did we? Oh, yeah. 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 We didn't even call each other. <laughs> <laughs> Kiersey and I always tried to match colors last year. <laughs> exactly. Unconscious. Your dresses never very looked impressive. the same. Um, three, years, three years we were doing it, and then it kind of fell out of sync a little off. bit. Yeah. Um, but actually, none of it was ever talked about. Actually really coordinated? Kind of weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a weird, hey, it must it, be it a was yellow kind day. Of weird. What we sure. Wow. This is on. But anyway, I just I wanted to thank. Uh, <laughs> Ted, also, I really appreciated your chairing. I appreciate being on this end. <laughs> I like to be down here. <laughs> um, but I also just want to point out, I think you've had some of the most entertaining meetings, mm-hmm. for example, with the Audison mm-hmm. thing. That's, that's, mm-hmm. I really like that and mm-hmm. think it brings a lot. And it's fun, too. So thank, thank you very much. All right, moving on then, community relations. Time. Um, Say it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Since I have nothing to report, I did want to take a moment mm-hmm. of privilege to thank you, Judd, for this year. Mm-hmm. It was, it has been a really nice way mm-hmm. to leave this committee, and it's made the decision far easier because all of the um, mm-hmm. collaboration mm-hmm. and collegiality mm-hmm. that have been demonstrated this last year. Mm-hmm show me mm-hmm. what a functional body this is and how despite differences of perspective mm-hmm. or opinion everybody is rowing together working mm-hmm. towards mm-hmm. that student achievement goal and and um it's really been a privilege mm-hmm. to be here so thank you, thank you. Mm-hmm. curriculum instruction assessment and accountability Dr. nothing Nelson. to report facilities nothing to report just have a few things. Uh, we have a very special presentation on Saturday, March 29th, this coming Saturday at 7.30 at the Town Hall. Senator, uh, Representative Sean Garbley was very instrumental in getting the 2013 Red Sox World Series trophy to Town Hall. For yeah, all to how visit. did they do that? That's amazing. <laughs> first you know, I heard people talking about it in the stop and shop. We got it, we got it they the were last all time. Like, they were it's all like, a cool event. oh, yeah, they're good. And at first, I didn't know who they were talking. I thought they were talking about like some famous person. Like, oh yeah, we got to go down and get our pictures taken. I'm like, what are they talking about? And then I heard about it. Yeah. Was it cool? Yeah, that's cool. I, I, oh, that's to see awesome. It up close, uh, having having seen it and touched it, it's really mm-hmm. it's really cool. They let you touch it. Fan. I can mm. sort of get in there. Um, <laughs> Funny. On uh, Thursday, April third, a week from tonight, from seven thirty to nine, uh, there's going to be an event at Temple of Muna. In Lexington, uh, it's my synagogue. It's um, a remembering Newtown uh, mm-hmm. presentation uh, with some some members of uh, the Newtown clergy and and uh, people who are there. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a really, mm-hmm. I think, interesting evening. I'm going to plan to be mm-hmm. there. I was reading from the American School Board Journal just this week, mm-hmm. and there was one of the uh, trends um, that popped out at me that there have been 44 school shootings since Newtown. Um, the school shooting has occurred every 10 days since the December 2012 shooting massacre there. So something that we need to keep our eye on. Um, um, on the issue of other towns and other, well, Temple Moon is in Lexington. Bedford has had some recent uh, problems over the last few weeks. And I just want to um, mm-hmm. make a statement, hopefully make a statement for the committee. Um, that we stand with with mm-hmm. Bedford in its fight against mm-hmm. um, intolerance and mm-hmm. obvious hate, hate-filled graffiti and statements mm-hmm. at, in the schools. Mm-hmm. And I know the superintendent there has spoken on this a few times and has had public mm-hmm. uh, town halls on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. something we should be aware of in Arlington. We have we are lucky to have mm-hmm. the Arlington Human Rights Commission here, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. they do a lot of good work mm-hmm. for us mm-hmm. when things like that happen. Um, mm-hmm. And there is a rapid response part of that mm-hmm. committee too that's been formed in terms of when should that ever happen it is as how do you mobilize everybody in town that's would have um, ability to to respond mm-hmm. 
Um, and it's been a pleasure serving as chair this year. It's been a real um, honor and uh, privilege to speak with Dr. Bodie regularly and speak with all of you um, every other Thursday night and um, see what kind of work that we can do to mm -hmm. maximize the goal, which is um, mm -hmm. education and I would learning. And I would share that too. I, I, mm -hmm. I had a wonderful year working with you, very open-minded very easy to discuss mm -hmm. and we had some mm -hmm. tough things to talk about at times and mm -hmm. very uh, very responsive and also measured and calm and and I've appreciated it mm -hmm. and I'm gonna miss those uh, introductions you do they're very mm -hmm. very well thought pressure. out oh pressure right <laughs> pressure. <laughs> oh, trust me man, I had to follow <laughs> Kuro come on yeah, it was, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Secret, yes, Mr. Chairman, just uh, to pile on, um, <laughs> one, one of the most important things about being a chair is leading the committee to the decision it wants to make. And that's more of a facilitator's role. You're representing us. You're sharing with us. You're giving us the information and standing back and letting us deliberate. You had a firm but gentle ha hand on the gavel, making sure the meeting progressed, making sure we stayed on topic and got to the decisions without in uh, and standing b uh, back from your own point of view, which I think is the sign of an excellent chair. You've done a great job for us over the past year, and I'm very appreciative of your work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, would you like to speak? Yeah. Uh, and in light of what has just been said and gone on, I want to apologize for feeling a need to seek this moment of personal privilege. On Tuesday, March 25th, a political card, not from any school committee candidate, was published to the people of Arlington that had a statement that was not true. I, Bill Hainer, initiated the Kindergarten Advisory Committee and that the procedure that eliminated this fee was brought to the committee's attention by Ruth Ellen Jacob, one of the parents on this committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Secretary's report. We're going to talk Last about one. what we're talking about, which is reading the correspondence. That's all right. I won't yeah. miss it. <laughs> correspondence for the school committee, March 27th, 2014. We have received the following correspondence. Commissioner's weekly update dated March 14th, 2014, as well as one dated March 21st, 2014. Email from Corey Gaffney on personal development days for Arlington teachers. Notice of Remembering Newton, an evening of reflection and repair on Thursday, April 3rd from 7.30 to 9 at Temple Emanua in Lexington. A Boston Globe article entitled The Poor Neglected Gifted Child, forwarded by way of Chair Mr. Pierce. Press release from Dr. Bodie on the hiring of a new special education director in Arlington. Yay! Articles from Washington Post about kindergarten teacher in Cambridge, as well as the Finnish high school graduation test, which I found fascinating. Um, the MEP conference saved the date from Chair Pierce. Information on the Model Congress trip. Copy of letter to Karen Tassoni about energy efficiency incentive check, which I had no idea what that means, in the amount of $90,981. Uh, information from Dr. Bodie about the day at the Cambridge Innovation Center on April 11th. Copy of the letter, attachments, and SOI on rebuilding Arlington High School. Woo, -hoo, go us. Mm -hmm. Document on the unfunded and underfunded <laughs> state and federal mandates and guidelines for lobbying in preparation for the MASC Day on the Hill. MASC invitation to a discussion on park implementation, a district perspective, and invitation to the Gilbert and Sullivan Club production of Footloose next weekend, and a form to order tickets. That's it. Just a quick question. Dr. Bodie, those of us that are interested in going to that uh, event on the 11th, do we talk to you or talk to Karen? Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. Either one. <laughs> yeah, one of those. I get the message, yeah. I, I, already got got your email. I already got your email. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, then moving on to uh, executive session, uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Mm -hmm. To discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body. And the mm -hmm. chair says, declares uh, the Arlington Administrators Association AAA contract. And I have a motion on that? So moved. Second. Are we exiting only for the purposes of adjournment? 
for or do we need a vote? I think you want to vote on okay. this. Yeah. So exiting to uh, come back out into regular session to vote on mm -hmm. contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, then we should be quick. Okay. So move. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I said it already. Second session. <laughs>
Regular session. May I have a motion, Ms. Heim? Um, I would like to move uh, to authorize the chair to sign, on behalf of the committee, to sign the contract with the AAA. Second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Abstentions? 7 0. I would like to move. Um, <laughs> the meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Second. Second. Permanently. <laughs> All those in favor of permanent adjournment. Aye. aye. Of this, this committee. And the meeting is dissolved. Oh. Ooh. The committee. I, I,